Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, Parallel Deku, back with another fanfiction. This is the second part of, What if Deku was in love with Ibarra? Now before starting, please give this video a like, and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Monday couldn't come fast enough for the first year students of UA. S Hero Course. After a nice relaxing weekend they were refreshed, recharged and ready to get started on their possible internships. Everyone was excited at the possibility of receiving offers. But the future heroes were just as nervous as they were anxious. Welcome back. I trust that you all enjoyed your break. Ken told the students as he set down an absolutely massive stack of papers down on his desk. I don't see a point in making you guys wait. So let's get right down to business. He continued before activating the smart board. Internship offers. Midoriya 2019. Ken do 1187. Shizaki 1062. Takage 1003. Onuki 894. Yanagi 704. Tetsu Tetsu 450. Monoma 362. Shishida 111. Bondo 94. Sunotori 86. Awaste 26. The offers are spaced out relatively evenly, but those who made it further in the tournament stage got the most. The only other students who received more are in 1A. The themed hero simply stated, But head so not fair. Subiraba groaned, throwing his head back in defeat. Man, I didn't get any. Kamakiri followed up. I guess it's only natural that Midoriya-kun and Kendushin got the most since they both tied for third place. Him surprised they didn't get more. Shota responded. There was a brief pause as Kan handed out the lists of offers to all of the students who received them. Midoriya took a moment to sift through thousands of names and agencies of his own stack and was definitely surprised at what he saw. The most prominent names that stuck out to him were Endeavor, Best Genist, and the dragon heroine Rukyu. He was almost certain that any offers that he received would have been rescinded after his match, but apparently that wasn't the case. However, one name stuck out to him the most. The Blizzard Hero Agency. Fubuki Katsuragi, more commonly known as Blizzard, was a well-known heroine based out of Saitama Prefecture. More importantly, she was one half of the Psychic Sisters. The telekinetic heroine was pretty popular a few years ago. But that was before the sudden disappearance of her older sister, the former number 4 ranked heroine Tornado. From what he knew, the woman recently restructured her agency to focus strictly on rescue and recovery operations. Subsequently, this made her one of the more prominent rescue heroes in all of Japan. While Midoriya was going through his list of offers, Takage was doing the same. The girl was definitely proud of herself for how many heroes she managed to impress, and she had no idea where to even start. When it came to her list, names such as Rukyu and Edshot were the first to catch her eye. Even Midnight had put in a request for her, much to her own surprise. Before the students had a chance to think about it any further, Kan's voice brought him back to reality. Despite these results, y'all all be interning with pros. Those of you who got offers have until tomorrow to decide where you want to go. The rest of you will be assigned a pro hero and y'all be notified in the morning. The themed hero informed his students, more than a few of them smiling that they were still getting a chance to do an internship. Awesome. Now, on to the next order of business. You all have to pick out hero names. As if she were waiting outside the door for her cue, Midnight flamboyantly bursted into the classroom and made her way to the front. Midnight is going to be taking point on this. To be frank, she has a better affinity for this kind of thing than I do. So she'll have final approval over what you choose. What you pick today could be your codename for life. So you'd better be careful, or you'd be stuck with something utterly indecent. The black-haired woman stated in a seductive tone that surely wasn't appropriate for a class of high school students. It didn't take long for everyone to get down the business and start brainstorming possible hero names. More than a few students were bouncing ideas off of each other. But for the most part, everyone had already decided on what they were going to choose. All right, who among you is ready to share midnight asked the class. Unexpectedly, Takage was the first to raise her hand and make her way up to the podium. The green-haired girl had no trouble picking her name because she had already decided on one a long time ago. With as much confidence as she could muster, the girl presented her submission and showed the class her whiteboard. Lizardy, she smiled brightly. Oh, I love it, Midnight Coot after hearing this. Unbeknownst to all the students except for Tetsu Tetsu, this was actually the nickname that the R-rated heroine used to call the girl back when she was a kid. Yeah, it's a good one. Kendu nodded. With the official seal of approval, Takage made her way back to her desk and let the others get their submissions out of the way. The class spent the next 10 minutes or so presenting their names. Most everyone picked something that suited their personality or their quirk, such as Tetsu Tetsu who went with Real Steel, or Kendu who ended up choosing Battle Fist. The only one that left everyone confused was Shishida's submission, Jevaden. But after a quick Google search, everyone agreed that it was pretty appropriate. The final one to make his submission was Midoriya. The verdant teen nervously made his way up the podium and gave out a bit of sigh before speaking. Honestly, I had a pretty difficult time picking this one out. But after thinking about it for a while, it seemed appropriate for what I can do, even if it is a bit misleading. The boy explained before showing his classmates what he wrote. Skywalker. He simply said as he waited for the others to comment. Oh, I like it. Very fitting. Midnight nodded with a smile on her face. It makes logic. 
Tsunotori said. Yeah, the Waze agreed. Since you can fly it seems like the perfect name. I feel like I've heard that somewhere before. Fukudashi's thought bubble spelled out. I thought he was gonna pick something weather-related like his older sisters. Honuki joked. With that out of the way, the students were dismissed for lunch. Before leaving, Kan once again informed them that they had until tomorrow to choose who they'll be interning under. For the students who didn't get any offers, they were going to be assigned one. Man, best day of class ever Takage beamed as the students of 1B made their way out of the classroom to head to the cafeteria. Feeling quite proud of herself, he'll say, I still can't believe that you guys got over a thousand offers. Man, you're so lucky. Tetsu Tetsu groaned. Hey, 450 offers is nothing to sneeze at Tetsu Tetsu. At least you got more than Monomassin. I guess. The Steel Quirk user agreed, but still not entirely satisfied with himself. So have you decided who you're going to intern with, Setsuna? No, I'm going to have to think about it tonight. What about you guys, she answered. I'm going with Gunhead. Kendu told her. He's a battle hero so it's more of my speed. Plus I heard he has a pretty nice dojo. I believe he'll be going with Kamui Woods. Shizaki was next to speak. Seriously? Yes. His reputation took a hit because of that whole sludge villain thing last year. Him, Mount Lady, Backdraft and Dearth Arms had to put in some serious overtime after that. Yes, but he's also shown that he's repented for his folly and has done some wonderful things in the community since then. And our quirks are a good match, the vine-haired girl stated. Still, Midoriya got over 2,000. Him getting a headache just thinking about having to sort through all of that. Speaking of which, Kendu looked around for a moment. Whereas Midoriya can he always disappears during lunch. He said that he's not good with crowds. Takage answered. Although, she herself wondered where the other greenette scurried off to during lunch. She hoped that after their not date he would be more comfortable eating around others. But apparently that just wasn't the case. While his classmates were enjoying their food in the school cafeteria, Midoriya was relaxing on the roof of one of the main campus buildings. Shortly after starting classes at UA, the boy found out that students were allowed to come up here during their lunch period. As luck would have it, the place was pretty much empty besides himself and a few others that occasionally made their way up there every now and then. But he didn't mind it one bit. The boy had grown accustomed to eating by himself ever since his days in elementary school. If he was being honest, this was one of the few times throughout the day that he could relax in between classes. Most of his time up here was spent powering through his lunch and jotting down notes in his latest hero analysis book, while the rest was spent collecting his thoughts and staring at the afternoon sky. At the moment, he was still going over who he was going to do his internship with. The Endeavor Agency was already out of the question, so he tossed that one to the side. But the one that stuck out to him the most was the offer from Blizzard. Logically speaking, it was the perfect place for him to go. Not only did him and Blizzard have similar quirks, she was rescue hero and very skilled at her job. Stories had been popping up over the last year about her intervening in crisis situations all over the place. And unlike a lot of female heroes nowadays, she didn't use her looks to garner attention from the hero tabloids and news sites. The boy laid down and closed his eyes for a brief moment to further think about what he was going to do, but a bubbly female voice interrupted his train of thought. You with a voice called out to him. Midori had jerked open his eyes and found himself staring into a set of sky blue orbs looking down at him. Out of instinct, he immediately jumped up and backed into the nearby wall, only for him to hit his head up against the concrete. Oh, he groaned while clutching the back of his skull. You okay? The voice asked him in a worried tone. Once the blurriness settled, Midoriya finally looked up at who decided to intrude on his alone time, but immediately regretted it once he did. He was a girl. A girl with flawless skin, long flowing sky blue hair and eyes to match. She was casually floating about a meter off the ground and giving him a concerned look. Almost instantly, the boy's face heated up at the sight of this person and he suddenly felt his mouth go dry. W who are you he accidentally shouted while covering up his face. Mainly out of instinct but also slightly out of embarrassment. How's it going? Izuku Midoriya the girl greeted him in the same bubbly tone from form before. You know me. Of course I do she smiled back. I've actually been looking all over for you. I gave up on trying to find you and decided to come up here to look at the sky since my usual group of friends are busy with their work studies today. But lo and behold, here you are on the roof of the school like your typical anime protagonist. Do you come up here all the time oh? Did you fly up here you know it's technically against school rules to use your quirk outside of class. Right then again, I'm also breaking that rule since I'm using my quirk right now. The green-haired teen blinked a couple of times as he tried to process the word vomit that came out of the girl's mouth. Part of him was amazed that she could say all of that in one breath. And the other part wondered if that's how his own muttering sounded like to other people. Who are you? He repeated. Oh, I guess I haven't introduced myself yet have I the girl realized before floating over to him and extending her hand out. Him Nejair Hadu, third year. Nice to meet ya. Hey cello. He greeted back before remembering what she said a moment ago. W.Y. We're trying to find a meme. Because, I wanted to know if you were going to accept Rukia's internship offer or not. I asked her to send you one during the sports festival and she told me that she did. He lost her he tilted his head in confusion. Who the hell was this girl and why did it sound like she had so much influence over the number 9 heroine of all people? Of course I did Rukyu as a thing for people with flying quirks and he outfit our group perfectly. 
him interning at her agency right now and she's been looking to take on another student. And then you pop up and blow everyone away with your moves. You have a telekinetic quirk, right? Have you always been able to fly you? How fast are you? Do you want to have a race around the school? Can you do that thing where you bend a bunch of spoo? Time out Midoriya cut her off while holding his hands up in a T-shape. See, can you slow down, please? Oh, my bad. The girl giggled while literally twirling in the air. I have a bad habit of saying whatever comes to mind. It's fine. So anyway, she have you decided on who you're going to intern with? I bet you got a ton offers. Especially after beating the son of the number two hero. I still haven't decided. Oh, well, why not? She asked him. Are there too many to choose from? Kekinda. He awkwardly chuckled. Really well. Who sent you a request? Maybe I can help you out, my little koai. But be warned, I am biased. It was at this moment that Midoriya was trying to figure out if this was really happening or not. Here he was, on the roof of the school, with some girl who he didn't know talking his head off without a care in the world. Either he was the victim of some elaborate hazing prank by his upperclassmen, or he just had the strangest luck. In any case, he needed to get a handle on the situation before something even more strange happened. I'm sorry, I think we got off on the wrong foot. Can we start over? No problem, the Blinette smiled before setting herself down on the ground in front of him. Like I said before, I'm Nejair Hadu. I'm a hero course third year and I'm here to convince you to join me at Rukia's agency. Plus, I just wanted to get a chance to talk to you. Not a lot of people have quirks that allow them to fly like I can and wanted to ask you some questions. Okay, the boy said with a quick sigh. Him is Midoriya. Him a first year, also in the hero course. All right now that we've gotten our third introduction out of the way, let's get down to business. B but, so, tell me about your quirk. Is it just plain old telekinesis, or can you do other things I love asking people about their quirks? Mine is called wave motion. I can turn my stamina into waves of energy and use them in all sorts of different ways. Besides flying, I can shoot out energy blasts from my hands and feet. That sound amazing Midoriya blurted out before clasping his hands over his mouth. That was probably not the time for his love of quirks to take hold of him. Oh, you've got a curious mind just like I do. I like you we should hang out sometime and talk about quirks. There were many different words that Midoriya would use to describe the girl currently sitting in front of him. Free-spirited, scatterbrained, overly curious and airheaded were among the first. Obviously this girl had too much energy than she knew what to do with. But instead of pointing that out, the boy decided to answer one of her earlier questions. To answer your earlier question, Hado-senpai, I think I already picked out what agency I'm going to go do my internship with. He told her, even though it really wasn't any of the girl's business, he felt like giving her answer would help him end this conversation sooner rather than later. Who she leaned in a bit closer while waiting for him to tell her. Ah, sorry, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to intern at the Blizzard Agency. Oh, a man had to pouted while snapping her fingers. I was really hoping to get you to join us. Hey, now that I think about it, you and her kind of look alike. Are you two related? You both have green hair and green eyes. Oh, are you like the psychic sister's secret younger brother who's trying to make a name for himself without riding on their coattails? And I know, I get that a lot. But we're not related. Oh, okay then. I said with another smile to apologize for wasting your time and not accepting Rukia's offer. I know it sounds really bad to deny the chance to work with a top hero. Hey, no harm, no foul. The Blanette shrugged. By the grace of the universe, the bell rang, signaling the end of lunch. Midoriya never felt more relieved to go back to class than he did now. He may have had his daily alone time interrupted, but at least he was going to get a break from this mild interrogation. Have a good day, Hado Senpai. Midoriya said with a low bow before making a beeline straight for the door. He'll be up here tomorrow, I still want to know more stuff about your quirk. Have a good rest of your day, Koai the girl called out as he retreated into the building. Hadu was about to start making her way back to class herself before something on the ground caught her eye. A couple of meters in front of her was slightly worn out notebook titled, Hero Analysis for the Future Number 15. Oh no, he must have left this behind. The girl thought as she picked it up. Curiosity ended up getting the better of her and she decided to take a quick peek at its content. And the free-spirited teen was immediately blown away by what she read. She herself had a pretty big interest in quirks and heroes, but this guy took it to a whole different level. If his regular class notes were anything like this then he was probably in a student. Realizing that she was probably about to be late to her next class, the Blunette decided to locate the teen at the end of the day to return the item to him. But not before getting the chance to check out a few more of his entries. Hey Midoriya some babe with blue hair was looking for you earlier. The waist decided to say out loud in front of everyone as soon as Midoriya walked through the door. Across the room, Takage's ears perked up this interesting tidbit of information. Naturally, this caused the boy's cheeks to flush and he became acutely aware of how everyone's were now trained on him. Apparently the universe decided that he wasn't supposed to have an easy day today, so he tried to remedy this situation as soon as possible. Oh yeah, I know, was all he really managed to say while scratching his cheek. Damn dude, we haven't even been at school for two months and you're already Mr. Popular. Subiraba joked. Alright boys, that's enough. Kendu immediately scolded the two boys from the back of the room. You guys should be worried about your grades more than girls. Ouch, low blow man. Subiraba immediately deflated. Midoriya gave the girl a silent thank you before making his way over to his seat. 
However, he did miss the curious look that Takage was giving as we walked across the classroom. A girl was about to throw a teasing comment the boy's way before ectoplasm came into the room and ordered everyone into their seats. All right, students, settle down. It's time for everyone's favorite subject, math I hope you all studied over this long weekend, because today we're having a pop quiz. Tetsu Tetsu let out an audible groan before dropping his head onto his desk and resigning himself to his fate. When the final bell of the day rang, the Hero Corps students were quick to pack up their things and start making their way out of the classroom. As expected, most of the talk while the students were leaving was centered around the upcoming internships. So Mop Top, have you decided on who you're going to intern with Takage asked the boy as she put away her dinosaur-themed pencil case. Yes, he nodded. Who? He'll be going with the Blizzard Agency. Really the stoic voice of Yanagi caught his attention. In omitori kun you're really doing a terrible job at convincing us that she's not your older sister. Honuki joked while joining the conversation. What about you guys? The Verdant teen deflected. He'll be going with Snatch, the sand hero. The lipless teen stated happily. That's pretty cool. He specializes in captures so it makes a lot of sense for you. Yeah, I still haven't decided yet. Inagi was next to speak. Him surprised that Blizzard sent you a request. It's a good fit for you. Midoriya swears that he could hear a slight tinge of disappointment in the girl's voice. But he wasn't too sure considering her monotone way of speaking. Yeah, him in the same boat. Takage chuckled while patting the pale girl on the shoulder. Him gonna sort through my offers tonight. I think Metalhead said that he was going to go with fourth kind. That's pretty awesome. The conversation ended shortly after that and the students began making their way out of the main building. However, right as they made it past the front gate a certain female voice made her presence known. Yuhu, Koai, Midoriya and Takage turned around to see none other than Nejair Hadu floating towards them. The girl was sporting a pretty huge grin on her face and holding something in her right hand. Holy mega teats, Batman Takage internally shouted at the sight of the well-endowed teen. Once the sea of sky blue hair finally registered in her brain she assumed that this was the student that was looking for her friend earlier. You left this behind after our chat sorry, I couldn't help myself and snuck a peek or three. These notes are super awesome the girl practically shouted before landing on the ground in front of them. On the inside, Midoriya was in the middle of experiencing a minor heart attack. He didn't even realize that he left the thing up there until this very moment. Suddenly his hands felt clammy and he had to stop himself from using his quirk to rip the notebook out of her hands. This was not good. Not good at all. No one else was supposed to look at those. He already had a bad enough reputation as it was so far as he was aware. He didn't want to imagine what would happen if people found out he created a profile on every student in his class. You know her talkage arched a curious eyebrow him, still wondering who this blue-haired bombshell was. KK kind of. He stuttered out with a bit of redness on his face. Of course he does he's my new protege. Oh hey, I know you are that girl with the cool dismemberment quirk. How does that work? How far can you split your body apart? How long can you stay separated? Do you ever lose parts of your body? Oh wait, are you walking home together? Ooh, are you a couple? You two look really cute together. While Midoriya quickly descended into a blushing mess, Takage couldn't help but laugh at this girl. Whoever she was, she definitely seemed like the type of free spirit that she liked. Deciding to make the most of this opportunity, the girl played along with her inquiry. In a mop top, she does have a point. We do look really cute together. Takage grinned at him while batting her eyelashes. The boy's blush further intensified while Hattis' eyes practically lit up at this grave misunderstanding that his classmate just created. Oh wow so you two are dating that's awesome how'd you meet how long have you been going out? MMMY notebook the boy dodged the questions and turned their focus back to the object in the girl's hand. Oh, right. Here you go she handed it back to him. I was looking at it during class. You have wonderful observation skills. There's even pictures of all your classmates in their hero costumes. I got bored so I added myself in there. You should take a look at it. Curiosity got the better of him in that moment and Midoriya immediately flipped the book open to its newest page. And sure enough, there was an entry about the blue-haired girl on it. Granted, it wasn't anywhere near as detailed as his notes, but it was a pretty solid base to work off of if he ever wanted to add to it. Also, the girl took the liberty of adding a chibi version of herself in the middle of the page. What's this about Takage wondered while trying to sneak a peek at the book herself, only for Midoriya to immediately close it and stuff it away in his bag. Thank you, H. Hado Senpai. Don't mention it. Anyways, I need to get going home. I'll see you later. Bye Koai, bye Koai's girlfriend. She said with a wave before walking off in the opposite direction. While she seems energetic, Takage stated while watching the girl retreat into the distance. I guess that's the blue-haired babe that was trying to hunt you down earlier. Yet the boy sighed in a defeated tone while dropping his shoulders. So tell me more about this notebook of yours. Three will see you tomorrow, takage -sen. was the last thing he said before retreating down the road. His face almost an entirely new shade of red. All the girl could do was give a confused shrug before heading off to the train station to catch up with Tetsu Tetsu. Whatever that was all about, she was sure that he'd tell her whenever he was ready. However, the mention of him having a page on all of his classmates did spark her curiosity. I wonder what he wrote about me in there. The first day of the internships quickly arrived for Class 1B and the students were having a hard time containing their excitement. 
At the moment, nearly the entire class was huddled together in the Musutafu train station waiting to be released by their teacher, the themed hero taking an extra bit of time to make sure that everyone had what they needed before embarking on their week-long journey. All right, you guys are all set and good to go. Make sure that you take full advantage of this opportunity and learn as much as you can. And don't forget to mind your manners can announce to his students. Yes, sir, the hero course hopefuls shouted in unison before heading towards their respective trains. For the most part, their class was spread pretty evenly throughout the country, and only a few of them were going to the same destination. Hey, Tetsu Tetsu, where Satsuna Kendu asked the Steel Quirk user. Her internship is close to home so she got permission not to come to school today. How fortunate, Shozaki added. What about you guys? The boy turned his head to the rest of the group consisting of Midoriya, Yanagi, Honuki, and Tsunotori. Me and Tsunotorichin are both going to Tokyo. The gray-haired girl was the first to answer. Oh, I'm heading that way as well. Will we be riding the same train the vine-haired girl inquired? I think so. I guess he'll be joining you guys since my internship is in Fuchu. The lipless teen smiled to his classmates. Man, you guys are lucky. I have to go all the way to Aim. Kendu laughed. What about you, Midoriya-kun? Blizzard's agency is in Saitama. It's only a four to five minute train ride from here. The greenette responded. Well, I hope you guys have fun. Good luck on your internships. The orange-haired class rep told the group before heading towards her terminal. Everyone gave each other one final goodbye as the group split off to board their respective trains. Naturally, they were going to take this seriously. But the students were more than happy to get started and learn all they could. A week may not have been a lot of time, but it was their duty as future heroes to make the most of this opportunity. And they were more than ready to rise to the occasion. Midoriya had to take a moment to calm his nerves as he marveled at the building before him. As soon as he stepped beyond those emerald green double doors, he would officially be starting his internship with Blizzard. Naturally, he was feeling more than a bit anxious about this entire thing. But his excitement was just as great. With one last breath, he gathered up as much confidence as he could muster before making his approach. First impressions were important, and the last thing he wanted was to come off as incompetent or nervous to the woman that was kind enough to waste her time on a mere hero course hopeful such as himself. The moment he entered the building, the boy was met with a rather lively reception area. A few people in hero costumes were walking around and conversing with one another, while others were simply lounging about in what he assumed to be some type of rest area. To his knowledge, there were 35 heroes in total currently working in this agency, and from the looks of it, there was no shortage of excitement. Welcome to the Blizzard Hero Agency, how may we help you a voice to his left inquired. The boy turned his head and was met with the sight of a young woman in a plain black pantsuit. From what he could tell, she was no more than a few years older than him. She had long black hair styled in a ponytail with a single blue streak down the middle, along with a hair accessory in the shape of a white tiger lily. Hey, hello, he greeted her with a low bow. Hi, I am Izuku Midoriya. I'm supposed to be interning here for the next week. The woman stared at him intensely for a second before nodding her head. Yes, Fubikusen has been expecting you. Please, come with me. She ordered before walking off into the direction of a nearby hallway. Yes, he agreed before following suit. A couple of minutes passed before the two arrived at a small changing room on the second floor. From what he could tell, the entire building was decorated rather lavishly, which was odd considering the conservative nature of the agency. There's a change of clothes inside. You can leave your school uniform and hero costume in there. Once you are finished, please come back down to the lobby, she said in a flat tone. Yes, thank you. He bowed once again before entering the room. Once inside, the boy wasted no time getting undressed and putting on his new outfit. It was a simple black tracksuit with a single green line down the side and a white t-shirt. I wonder why they are having me change into this. Maybe we're going to go right into training, he thought to himself. In no time, the telekinesis user was fully dressed and made his way back down to the lobby where the woman from earlier was waiting for him by the reception desk. Fubikissin is on the roof. She wants you to meet her up there. Oh, all right. He nodded as made his way over to the elevator. She also said that you're not allowed to take the stairs or the elevator. The black-haired woman suddenly added. Midoriya couldn't help the look of absolute confusion that crossed his face as he turned back around to face her. What did she mean he wasn't allowed to use the stairs or the elevator? How did she expect him to get up there another moment passed before the light bulb went off over his head? She wants me to fly up there. That's for you to figure out. The woman simply said while taking her seat back behind the desk. Deciding to just roll with it, the boy nodded and stepped back outside. As he looked up towards the top of the building, he felt his heart rate suddenly increase. In mere moments, he was going to be face to face with Blizzard. He had no clue what the woman was like. But if the last 15 minutes or so was any indication, she had to be an interesting character. Midoriya let out another quick breath before activating his quirk and levitating to the roof of the building. It only took him a few seconds to reach the top, and as soon as his head passed over the wall he was immediately met with something being thrown into his chest. What the hell Midoriya wondered after briefly fumbling with the object and looking down to see what was now in his hands. It was a simple black backpack not unlike the one he brought with him to school. It wasn't heavy by any means, but there was obviously something inside of it. Make sure you hold on to that. A female voice suddenly said directly in front of him. 
Follow me. Midoriya didn't even get a chance to look up before a gust of wind rushed past his face. Once he finally got his bearings, he turned around to see a green, human-shaped figure quickly retreating into the distance. The only noticeable feature that he could see was a patch of dark green hair on the person's head. She's fast, he thought. In the time it took him to him to look up, the woman was already about 300 meters away from him. On any other day, the boy would have taken the time to analyze the woman's quirk and her obvious mastery over the ability to fly. But now was not the time for that. Instead, he simply threw the backpack over his shoulders and gave chase. This is going to be interesting. While her classmates were on their way to their respective internships, Takage was casually strolling down the street with a smile on her face. Not only was she looking forward to officially starting her week-long adventure, but the fact that she didn't even have to bother going to school this morning was just icing on the cake. So with a belly full of breakfast and an extra two hours of sleep under her belt, she was more than ready to face the day ahead of her. It didn't take long before she found herself standing in front of her destination, the Edshot Hero Office. The girl was still surprised that the number five hero of all people sent her a request, but she wasn't one to look a gift horse in the mouth. In truth, she spent quite a bit of time going back and forth between coming here, the Ryukyu office or interning under Kayama. But in the end, she felt this was the best place for her to go. Headshot was a well-respected pro with a near-flawless career to his name, and he had one of the best arrest records in the entire country. Sure, becoming a rescue hero was ultimately her goal, but it would be beneficial in the long run to broaden her horizons and get a feel for other aspects of heroism as well. And there was no better place than here to learn such valuable information. Once she entered the building, Takage was quickly ushered towards the elevator by one of the staff members. Admittedly, the girl was having a hard time keeping her nerves in check and with good reason. What was the guy like? What did he plan for them to do today in public? The pro hero presented himself as a cool, calm and collected person who always knew what to do in times of a crisis. Was he the same way behind closed doors whatever he was like? She was definitely looking forward to her first encounter with the ninja hero. And she was more than ready to prove her worth. The ringing of the elevator quickly brought her out of ruminations and the doors opened up to reveal a large office decorated in a way that made it look like one of those old-school dojos that you would see in movies. Takage took a moment to marvel at the place and felt even more excited to begin working here. She spent the next couple of minutes perusing the place, but the longer she looked around the more concerned she grew. And there was one reason for this. Headshot was nowhere to be found. In all honesty, she was expecting some type of formal greeting. But when it became apparent that her mentor for the week was a nasho, she began to wonder if she was even supposed to be here in the first place. Your situational awareness needs work. A calm voice said immediately to her left, causing the girl to jump back and let out a slight yelp sound. Once she got her wits about her, Takage was met with the sight of a thin strand of red wire quickly reforming itself into none other than the number 5 hero himself. That's something that we'll need to work on. Holy shit, you scared the hell out of me the girl blurted out before recomposing herself and bowing before the man. Yes, there was the goal. The masked man simply said before making his way over the small table in the center of the room, motioning for her to join him. Takage quickly complied and took the spot across from him as he poured her a cup of fresh tea. Her previous excitement was quickly replaced with a slight bit of dread. Not even five minutes into the start of her internship and she's already made herself look like an idiot. First impressions are important, and her was definitely less than stellar. So hey do you think I send you an offer? Takage Sinead shot asked while handing the girl the cup. While the girl started before briefly thinking over her response, I would assume it was because of my performance in the sports festival. Yes, he did remarkably well from what I saw. But there are two main reasons as to why I decided to reach out to you. Two, she quirked an eyebrow at him. The first is that you seem to have a good grasp on how to play into your strengths. During the cavalry battle, your team stayed away from the limelight and you used your opponent's enthusiasm to your advantage. What about the second reason, sir? I find your quirk particularly interesting. Oh, the girl nodded her head in confirmation. That made a lot of sense. The two of them had a certain level of compatibility when it came to quirks. Your power has near limitless potential when it comes to espionage and stealth operations. Not only that, but its combat applications could be viewed in the same light. Your abilities could be a major turning point when it comes to battle. And you seem to have a good grasp on how to use them. Thank you, sir. The girl said with a toothy grin. While you are here this week, it will be my job to help you improve on your skill set and get you to expand your repertoire. But we can discuss that in further detail later. For now, I'd like to know what you're capable of as you are now. So please, tell me more about your quirk. Of course, Takage said as she placed the cup down on the table. I call my quirk Lizard Tail Splitter. I can detach any part of my body at will and can control those pieces remotely. As of right now, I can only safely split myself up into 25 separate parts. Trying to do more will dramatically drain my stamina and cause me to pass out. While in this state, all of my organs can function independently. Unfortunately, I can only maintain this form for about 5 minutes before I have to recall all of my pieces. Downsides. My biggest issue is exhaustion. I can regenerate lost pieces and small wounds to some extent. But doing so just drains my stamina depending on how bad it is. So you have multiple quirks. I wouldn't say so. The girl replied. 
The regeneration aspect of my quirk is slow, and it takes a lot of energy and calories. If my pieces are scattered for too long, the cells begin to die off at a pretty fast rate. The most I've ever lost was part of my arm and that took nearly a full day to grow back. On top of that, I had to eat a lot more than I usually do help speed up the process. Another thing is that I can only repair the damage after I put myself back together. The masked hero stayed silent for a moment as he processed this information. In his opinion, the girl's quirk was nothing short of spectacular. Not only did it make her polyvalent, but she could heal herself on top of that. He had no doubt that there was even more complexity to her quirk, but this was more than enough information to start with. I can see why you got into UA. On recommendations, the man said in what she assumed was a joking tone before standing up. You have your hero costume with you, correct? Yes, Sir Takage patted the metal briefcase with the number 14 on the front. Your room is on the next floor down. That's where y'all be staying for the remainder of your internship. Head down there, get dressed and meet me in the training room on the third floor. I want to get a better assessment of your skills. In the back of her mind, Takage had a pretty good idea of where this was heading. Sure, she wasn't expecting to get into a sparring match with a top hero on her very first day. But she was definitely looking forward to getting the chance to show what she can do. Without a moment's hesitation, the girl grabbed her things and made a beeline straight for the elevator. To say that Midoriya was confused would be an understatement. It had been five minutes ever since he and Blizzard took off from the roof of her agency and he had absolutely no clue as to where their destination was. He had never been to this part of the prefecture before so he there weren't any landmarks that he was able to recognize. And to make matters even more difficult, he was completely unable to close the distance between him and his apparent mentor for the week. Although his speed in the air was respectable, there was an obvious gap in their abilities. The woman hadn't said so much as word to him the entire time. The only acknowledgement from her that he received so far were the few times she would look back to see if he was still following her. In truth, he was starting to get worried. He was already halfway over his limit and there was seemingly no end in sight. On top of that, he was starting to feel a bit winded. Suddenly, and without any type of warning, the woman made a hard right around a building. Midori admittedly had a bit of trouble changing directions so harshly but was still able to keep up. Another minute passed before he spotted Blizzard floating in the air above what looked to be so kind of junkyard. With the end of their journey now in sight the green-haired teen kicked it into another gear and quickly put himself right next to her. Once they were side by side, he was finally able to fully take in her appearance. The woman was dressed in a tracksuit just like the one he was wearing, except the color palette was inverted. She had chin-length, dark green hair, emerald eyes the same color as own. And even though the two of them floating in the air, he could tell that they were roughly the same height. Honestly, I can see why everyone thinks we're related. That wasn't too rough on you as it Blizzard asked him a serious tone as she folded her arms. In a no mum, I can really only stay in the air for about 11 minutes before I need to take a break. He nervously responded. I see. The woman nodded her head before pointing towards the ground. You see that car right there she motioned towards an old pickup truck that had definitely seen better days. Yes. Are you able to lift that? Yes mum. Bring it up here. She ordered. The boy simply compiled with her demands and stuck his arm out towards the vehicle. Even though it was well within his weight limit, levitating the thing off the ground wasn't exactly a walk in the park. Once the truck was right in front of the two of them, Blizzard gave him a curious look that he couldn't really place. I want you to throw that as far as you can. Wait, is that safe someone could get hurt? A brief silence passed before Blizzard let out a slight chuckle. He doesn't really see what the pro heroine found so funny about that. The last thing he wanted was to injure someone on account of him being irresponsible with his quirk. Don't worry, the crew doesn't show up until the evening so you have nothing to fear. I come here all the time to train my quirk so I know how things operate around here. So don't be afraid to let loose. All Midoriya could do was nod in agreement before turning his attention back to the truck. The boy sucked in a bit of air and quickly sent the thing flying towards the other side of the junkyard. Once it was firmly out of his reach, the truck dropped to the ground with a loud crashing sound that resulted in a pretty sizable dust cloud in the distance. I'd say that's roughly 400 meters. Blizzard commented with a somewhat impressed expression. Is that the limit of your range? Yes, mom. Impressive was all she said before descending back down to the ground, causing the boy to follow suit. Once his feet were firmly back onto a solid surface, Midoriya released his quirk and stretched his muscles out a bit. When it came to using his quirk on himself, the feeling was similar to that of running. The longer he went, the more difficult it was to maintain his control, and accelerating with short burst was the same as sprinting. I'm not really one for formalities, so let's right into it. The woman started. I want to get a good idea of what you're capable of. The two of us are going to have a bit of sparring match with our quirks. The objective is simple, all you have to do is stop me from taking that bag off your back. Really Midoriya tilted his head in confusion. Obviously, it was a good idea to assess his skills. But getting into a battle right out the gate was a bit much. Yes, Blizzard nodded. We have free reign to use this entire area to our heart's content. If you can last three minutes without me taking that backpack, then y'all have passed your first test. Are those conditions acceptable to you, Izuku Midoriya? The boy took a moment to think about this. Part of him had the sneaking suspicion that this was some kind of setup. 
Obviously, the woman was much more adept than he was when it came to their quirks, and from everything he had seen on video, she was a good fighter. To make matters worse, he had next to no experience battling someone with a similar skill set to his own. Usually, he could rely on his mobility as an advantage over others. But this wasn't going to be anywhere near as easy. With as much confidence as he could muster, Midoriya gave the woman his best smile and took up a stance. That's fine with me. Excellent. Blizzard grinned. It was only after she found herself standing mere meters away from the number 5 hero did the reality of the situation finally set in for Takich. Although she was confident in her own abilities, she knew that the man had earned that title for a reason. In her mind, she knew she really only had one chance at defeating the masked man, and she was going to make sure that she took full advantage of that opportunity. Begin whenever you're ready, Headshot told her as he crouched down into his fighting stance. Takich was more than happy to do as the man said and wasted no time getting the party started. With her first move, the girl detached the bottom half of her left arm and sent it flying towards the pro. As expected, the man dodged it with little to no difficulty, but she was counting on that. The girl quickly followed up by turning her appendage around and attempted a strike to the back of his head. But much to her own surprise, the masked man was able to dodge that attack as well by simply sidestepping to his left. Seeing now that this was going to be just as difficult as she imagined, the girl detached her other arm and used both of her free-floating limbs to strike him in multiple places at once. But every single time she made a move on him, he would simply move out of the way. He's moving like water, and he hasn't even used his quirk yet. The girl clicked her teeth in annoyance. Is this the limit of your abilities? He asked her in a neutral tone. Not at all Takage shot back before splitting up the rest of her arms up into smaller pieces and sending a wave of flesh towards him. The guy may have been light on his feet, but even he would have had a hard time dealing with this. What happened next proved to Takage exactly why the masked man before her was able to earn the spot of number 5 hero in all of Japan. Quite literally in the time it took her to blink, Headshot activated his quirk and wrapped himself around not only all of her individual floating pieces, but the rest of her body as well. The entire room was covered in a thin strand of red wire and it left the greenette wondering just how fast he was really was when it came to his powers. Would you care to know what your first mistake was Edshot asked while forming his head in front of her face. What Takage grimaced while trying to break free from his grip. Just as she was about to split her body up and slip through the gaps in his quirk, the pro hero quickly filled them. You didn't restrict my movements. When it comes to someone with a quirk like mine, any opening that you allow could be used as an escape route. I thought you said you were able to split yourself up into 25 separate sections. I can, she told him, but it's not like I had a lot of time to think, and it's better to not spread myself so thin. The less I divide my body, the easier it is to control. A logical way of thinking. He retorted as he released his hold on her. This will serve as your first lesson. If you have an opportunity to pin down your opponent, then take it. When facing off against criminals, the earlier you restrain them, the sooner you can resolve the situation. And how do you suppose I do that? I have a few ideas, but we can discuss them while we're out on patrol. The green-haired girl paused for a second as she let the words set in. Patrol they were actually going to head out and do some real hero work this early, it was only the first day. Sure, she expected this to happen, but not so soon. A feeling of excitement quickly welled up in her chest and she had a hard time suppressing the smile that crept onto her face. Are you sure that's such a good idea I mean, I just got here? Is there like a learning curve or something? In my opinion, the most effective way to learn is through real-world experience and hands-on application. For the time being, I'll be more of an observer and an extra set of hands if the situation calls for it. But what I mainly want you to do is watch how I operate and absorb as much information as you can. Is it all right with you? Yes, sir. The girl practically cheered with a wide grin. Then let's head out. The man told her as he began making his way to the elevator and motioning for her to follow. With no hesitation, Takage fell into step behind him and mentally prepared herself for her first real taste of the world of heroism. Awkward wasn't a foreign feeling to Izuku Midoriya, not by a long shot. But when it came to his current situation, he couldn't help but feel just a bit more embarrassed than what he was used to. To say that the boy didn't even stand a chance would be a fairly accurate assessment. The match between him and Blizzard lasted all of four to five seconds before he was pinned to the ground. He was stuck on both knees as his body was being restricted by various pipes and pieces of scrap metal. In all honesty, he should've seen this outcome coming from a mile away. The moment the match between him and the green-haired woman began, he immediately took to the air to try and put some distance between the two of them. But Blizzard managed to cut him off with ease. Seeing that he had no chance of outrunning her, he reacted by lifting up a few pieces of junk around them and flung them at his opponent. However, the woman stopped the attack without so much as raising a finger and simply sent the pieces of scrap right back at him. Somehow the boy was able to dodge the attack. But in that time, Blizzard was able to close the distance between the two of them and used her quirk to force him to the ground. For a brief moment, the woman released her hold on her quirk and he was able to stand back onto his feet. His mind began racing on how to proceed from there. Blizzard had the advantage in speed and maneuverability. And to make matters worse, she could counter anything that he threw at her. 
Hoping to catch her off guard, the boy used his telekinesis to bring a car door in front of him in hopes of using it as shield while simultaneously launching another piece of scrap metal towards her. Unfortunately for him, Blizzard simply used her own quirk on his backpack and pulled him back a good 20 meters from where he was standing. The rest was pretty much history after that. Just when he got himself in order, various pieces of rusted metal and pipes wrapped themselves around his body and forced him to his knees. He tried his best to remove the objects, but the woman used her own quirk to keep them in place, signaling the end of the match. To be honest, you lasted longer than I expected. I was certain that I would be able to end this in less than 30 seconds. Blizzard taunted as she twirled the backpack in the air in front of him. But I believe that I have a pretty good idea of what you can do. The next thing Midoriya felt were the pipes uncoiling themselves from around his arms and torso and he was once again in control of his body. We may have only gone at it for less than a minute, but I can already see some glaring holes in the way you fight. You don't have a lot of experience going at it against people with similar quirks, do you the green-haired heroine inquired. No mum, he responded. There's a girl in my class with a telekinetic quirk, but her weight limit isn't that high and she can't use it on herself to fly. I see. She nodded while setting herself back onto the ground. There are three major observations I was able to make during our little sparring session. Can you guess what they are? The green-haired boy racked his brain for a moment as he replayed the last couples of minutes in his head. From his perspective, he was simply outclassed. Everything he was used to doing was easily countered by the woman in front of him. In short, there was nothing he could do. Instead of giving her an answer, he simply shook his head. The first is that you didn't use the area to your advantage. Blizzard stated as she held up one finger. When in a fight, you have to take the terrain into account. This entire area is full of things you could use to subdue an opponent. I understand. He nodded. A second is your hands. She held up another finger. Him sorry he said with a confused look. You telegraph everything that you're doing with the way you move your hands. It makes your moves easy to read. It's a habit that people with quirks like ours usually develop during childhood, so y'all have to learn how to break it. I see. Midoriya was now regretting not having his notebook with him. Not even a full hour into his internship and he was already receiving some invaluable information and advice. What about the third? The third is your lack of experience when it comes to fighting. Okay, I can tell that you're not used to being in a fight. That's something that we can work on while you're here. But it be in your best interest to try and get more battle experience. Yes, mom, but that's something we can talk about in greater detail while we eat. She told him as she unzipped the backpack that was still levitating above her hand and pulling out a few medium-sized plastic containers and a large blanket. This probably isn't the best atmosphere to eat in, but it's a better alternative than going all the back to the agency. Which do you prefer, steak or chicken? Uh, sea chicken mom. Please, Midoriya Kun, you can just call me Fubuki. The green haired woman smiled as she handed him his food. Right, sorry, Fubuki -san. The boy slightly blushed. The two telekinetic quirk users wasted no time in digging into their meal and engaging in a bit of small talk. Although Midoriya wasn't used to eating in the middle of the morning, that didn't stop him from him enjoying the food. He wasn't exactly sure how he thought his internship was going to go. But he was glad that his mentor seemed to be the easygoing type. So Midoriya Kun, I'd like to know the details of your quirk. Obviously we have similar ones, but I'd still like for you to explain it to me. Alright the boy answered as he readjusting himself. Well as you can already tell my quirk is telekinesis. A pretty straightforward title. Katsuragi joked. Yeah I'm not that good with naming things. Don't be ashamed, I call mine psychokinesis. Which is essentially the same thing. Oh he nodded before continuing. My quirk allows me to manipulate objects within a certain weight limit, including myself. As of right now, my maximum range is 400 meters and my weight is about 14,500 kilograms. But the last time I tried that, I ended up passing out for a few hours. I have no trouble lifting things such as cars or small trucks. But the longer I do that, the more taxing it is on my body. In addition to this, I'm able to wield six separate items at one time but that's all I can manage. I started out only being able to hold two things, but the more I practiced I was gradually able to improve over time. And it's difficult for me to focus if I try anything greater. When using my quirk on myself, I can reach a top speed of roughly 40 kph. But I can only hold that for a few seconds. The drawbacks to my quirk all come from extended use. Most of my symptoms include headaches, nosebleeds, lightheadedness, hunger and a bit of nausea that can last for a full day if I push myself too hard. On top of that, I can't move things I can't see. Once I have control of something I'm able to manipulate it with my eyes closed. But I can't grab something if I don't know it's there. And if I suffer any type of strong blow to the head I'm unable to use my quirk for a period of time depending on how bad the impact is. The longest I've been unable to use my quirk was for a full day after suffering a concussion when I was training. But everything went back to normal after that. Once the boy was done giving the woman a brief overview of his powers all he got in return was a blank stare. He really should find a way to limit things to 30 words or less. Okay I think I got most of that. To be honest, I'm surprised you were able to say that many words in one breath. Katsuragi said in an amused tone. Yes, sorry, I kinda have a habit of rambling. He awkwardly rubbed the back of his head. I can tell, but I am impressed by your skills. It took me until I was about your age to be able to move a truck without causing myself a migraine. 
and learning how to fly was a whole different issue altogether. Still, our quirks are remarkably similar, the woman said to herself. Well, but now I have a better understanding of what you can do, and I know exactly how we're going to move forward with your training. So what's the plan? Before the end of the week, I'm going to teach you how to maximize your usage. You're much too straightforward with how you handle things and it makes you predictable. Also, your way is simplistic. What do you mean? The green-haired woman chose not to respond. Instead, she brought over one of the nearby metal pipes still lying on the ground. Midoriya watched as the woman began bending it into all different shapes before straightening it out. Psychokinesis is a very versatile power. Not only are you capable of moving objects as they are, you should be able to reform them into different shapes to suit your needs depending on what it is. This pipe is a perfect example. Something like this should be well within your abilities. I see. The boy whispered. In all honesty, it never even occurred to him to do something like that. Give it a try. She told him while levitating the pipe directly in front of him. Midoriya let out a deep breath before taking hold of the object himself. Although it seemed like a monumental task, he actually had less difficulty doing it than he expected. With his palm facing outward, the boy brought his fingers together in a clamping motion while imagining the pipe bending at the center, forcing the hollow metal tube to bend in half. He couldn't tell if it was due to the materials that the thing was made of or some other factor, but the action was rather easy. How he never thought of doing something like this beforehand was a mystery to him. However, that was as far as he could go. When he attempted to duplicate his mentor's earlier action and twist the pipe into a coil shape, he found it considerably harder than simply bending it in half. We'll have time to work on it after we get done this afternoon. Done with what? Our afternoon patrol. The woman announced, causing the boy's eyes to light up with excitement. Things were about to get a lot more interesting. After returning to the agency, Midoriya quickly ran up to his room and made the necessary preparations to head on out patrol. Naturally, the boy was looking forward to going out and getting a feel for what actual hero work was like. But there was still a slight bit of nervousness gnawing at the back of his head. His morning training session with Katsuragi was a bit of an eye-opener on how much he still needed to improve when it came to his quirk. There was no doubt that he would be able to learn a lot from the woman. So it was his duty to ensure that he absorbed as much information as possible in the seven days that he was going to be under her tutelage. As he cracked open the metal case with the number 18 written on it, he couldn't help but smile at the new addition to his costume. Much like the rest of his outfit, the helmet's design was simple. It was straight black with green lenses that matched the color of his eyes. The piece of equipment was also designed to completely cover his head and had a good amount of padding on the inside. As he inspected it a bit further, he noticed a piece of paper tucked into one of the pads near the crown of the head. Dear Izuku Midoriya, the support company would like to formally apologize for the delay in finishing your requested item. Due to a shortage of materials along with your late submission, extra time was needed to complete the design. Thank you for understanding. Also, we here at the UA, support course took it upon ourselves to add a few features that weren't in the original schematics. After your match in the sports festival, infrared lenses were added to help assist you in any future hero operations. Instructions for how to operate are inside of the case. If you have any further questions, please contact your support course representative, which is me. Mei Hatsum. I guess the support course has free reign to alter designs without clearing it with us first. The boy thought as he set the item down on his bed. Even if he didn't ask for it, he was grateful that someone was looking out for him when it came to overcoming one of his weaknesses. I have to make sure to thank this Hatsune person whenever I see her. A few minutes passed before the boy was fully dressed in his costume. He was almost completely ready to make his way down to the lobby. But there was one unforeseen issue that was still holding him up. His helmet didn't fit. The measurements were exactly spot on from his request form. But the boy obviously failed to factor his hair into the equation. When he tried to put it on, either the fit was too tight or tufts of his green mane would cover his eyes. Before he could think of a solution to this wardrobe malfunction, a knock at the door drew his focus. Come in he called out, prompting Katsuragi to enter the room. Much like his costume, hers was relatively simple. The woman was dressed in a dark green form-fitting dress, knee-high black boots and a white fur overcoat that cut off at her waist. Are you ready? Midoriya come the green-haired heroine asked while giving him the once-over. Almost. He responded with a slight blush on his face. Him just having a bit of an issue. What's wrong? It's my helmet it doesn't quite fit. You're just now figuring this out I thought you've had your hero suit for a while now. My helmet was just finished, so this is my first time trying it on. The measurements are right but my hair just keeps getting in the way. He bashfully admitted. And Katsuragi rubbed the side of her face for a second before an idea popped into her head. I have some hair gel in my office. That should hold be able to help. But you might want to consider getting a haircut. It's a more efficient solution. That's probably a good idea. He responded. The boy couldn't even remember the last time he cut his hair. He was never one to care about his appearance all that much. But if it made wearing his support item easier, then it was just a necessary evil. Let's go to my office so we can handle this. I want us to get as much patrol time as possible today. It may be a Wednesday, but most people are out on their lunch breaks right about now and that means there shouldn't be a shortage of work. 
Katsuragi stated as she made her way towards the door. Yai's mum. The first two hours of her first ever patrol were not as exciting as Takage had imagined. Her and her mentor for the week had pretty much spent the entire time walking around one of his designated routes while he gave her a few tips and tricks of the trade. Part of the girl was itching to see some action, but she was well aware that the less work the two of them had to do, the better. As you are already aware, heroes are nothing more than civil servants just like the police and firefighters. The only real difference is that we're allowed to use our quirks to handle any situation that we run into. Our main job is to control crime and assist in any matters that we can. The masked hero stated as the two turned a corner. Yes, sir. Takage responded while taking mental notes. Heroes can be specifically requested by the police or handle anything that we run into and keep things contained until villains can be arrested and sent in for processing. We file reports for the work we do and then the Hero Public Safety Commission reviews them and that's how we get paid. The bigger the job, the more money we earn. Yeah, my aunt was telling me about how there's a special agency within the HPSC that has like 30 members whose job is to look over all the resolved cases. I take it your aunt is a hero then. Yes, sir. Good, then I'm sure you're already aware of how tedious the process can get. The sooner you complete your paperwork, the less of a headache you have to deal with. Most pros have to set aside time throughout their day strictly for paper pushing, or they have a staff member handle it for them. Once we get back to the agency, I'll show you how to properly fill those out. I'm looking forward to it. The green-haired girl was cut off when a loud boom and the sound of shattering glass interrupted her. Someone help we've been robbed a middle-aged woman standing in front of what looked to be some type of jewelry store cried out. In the distance, Takage could see a group of men dressed in all black jumping into pickup truck near the crime scene. Stay here and make sure that woman is alright. He'll handle those thieves Edshot ordered before sprinting down the road and activating his quirk to swing in between the light poles. Not a moment's hesitation. I guess that's a top hero for you. The girl thought before running towards the woman. Are you okay? Was anyone injured? Him fine, you don't have to worry about me. But those hooligans completely cleaned us out. Don't worry mom, Edshot's here. Hell deal with those guys in a flash. She reassured the woman. In situations like these it was best to keep the victim calm. That was pretty much the first lesson of heroing 101. And with a top hero on the scene, there was nothing to worry about. Thanks goodness. The woman breathed a sigh of relief. Further down the road, Edshot had closed the distance between him and the escaping vehicle. Unfortunately for the group of villains, their getaway hit a bit of snag. Due to the fact that it was rush hour the upcoming crosswalk was filled with civilians. Not looking to add manslaughter onto an already substantial armed robbery charge, the woman behind the wheel began honking the horn to alert everyone to get out of the way. This proved futile though as the people didn't move in time, forcing her to hit the brakes. Damn it the man in the back seat cursed while preparing his quirk. That's Ed's shot. I thought you said he doesn't come through this area during the week. He must have switched up his route. It doesn't matter though, there's four of us and one of him another said while opening the car door. Let's hurry and handle him before some other heroes show up. Three of the villains proceed to jump out of the vehicle and wasted no time in engaging the pro. The first man used his quirk to fire off small ice spikes from his hands while the other produced a few heated spikes from his. The masked hero had no issue in dodging these attacks and had already picked out his first victim. A large man with orange skin who obviously had no long-range capabilities. He'll deal with this one quickly and incapacitate the other two. Their driver is still in the car so shall be last. He told himself before activating his own quirk and launching himself towards the man. Ninpo, Thousand Sheet Pierce. What the pro hero was expecting was for the man to have a hardening quirk. His razor thin sheet of red wire practically bounced off the guy like a coin on the pavement. No good, I'll go after the ice user then. Headshot proceeded to redirect himself and pierce the chest of the other man, knocking him out instantly. With one down, his new target was the other spike user. But just as he was about to deliver the finishing blow, the hardening quirk user jumped in his way. That trick won't work on me hero you're out of your element the orange-skinned man taunted in a smug fashion. Well it's a good thing that he has help a female voice suddenly said from above them. Out of nowhere, both of the remaining villains and the car began floating into the air. Everyone in the surrounding area upturned their gazes to see a green-haired woman levitating in the sky along with another person wearing all black. Blizzard, Skywalker, keep this truck suspended in the air and don't let that person open the door. He'll deal with these two. Blizzard commanded the masked individual. All right, Midoriya nodded before taking control of the vehicle. The person inside was doing her best to open the driver's side door, but he was able to hold it in place. And make sure you take notes. What happened next only further confirmed the gap between the two telekinetic users' abilities. Everyone watched as Blizzard ripped one of the awnings off a nearby building and wrapped the metal frame around both of the villains before setting them onto the ground. With a clear shot, Edshot used his quirk to pierce the mouth of the larger of the two men before doing the same to other one. With those two out of the way, the three turned their attention back towards the last remaining person in the truck. Get me out of here the woman screamed out as her hand reformed into a giant metal claw and pierced through the door. He'll take it from here, Blizzard said while retaking control of the truck. The green-haired heroine then pulled the door off of its frame and used her quirk to grab hold of the villain before forcing her to the ground. She's all yours, Edshot. 
Yes, the masked hero simply said as knocked out the woman with the same move from earlier. With all four of the robbers now subdued, the two greenettes descended onto the ground before making their way over to the number five hero. Thanks for the help. He'll admit I was going to have a hard time finding an opening with that hardening user. You came right in time. Headshot gave the two a slight bow. Don't mention it. Blizzard waved off. Oh my god, it's the number five hero. Headshot I completely forgot that his agency is in this area. Man, I wish I had the time to get his autograph. His quirk is so versatile Midoriya silently fanboyed inside of his head. Thankfully he was wearing his helmet or the two pros would've seen the expression of absolute astonishment plastered all over his face. It's a surprise seeing you around here. I thought you usually patrol the shopping area near the financial district. You're right, but I thought I'd switch things up today to give my intern here a lay of the land. In turn the masked hero turned his gaze towards Midoriya. Well that's a coincidence, I also have. Is everything all right over here? A familiar voice called out. Midoriya looked to his left to see none other than his classmate quickly sprinting towards their location. Talk Ageson. Lizardy, how's that woman? She's fine, no injuries. She told me that she was okay and called the police. I thought it was a good idea to come over and see if you needed any help. Good job, but in the future make sure you wait until after the police arrive before leaving the scene of a crime. The masked man said in a matter-of-fact tone. It was a simple rookie mistake, so there was no need in making a big deal about it. Yes, sir. The green-haired girl awkwardly smiled before glancing at other two people. The first person she knew almost immediately with her dark green hair and expensive-looking coat. The other person took her second before she recognized the outfit. He may have been wearing that cool-looking helmet now, but there was no mistaking who it was. Mopped up. You know each other Blizzard raised an eyebrow at her intern. H. Hello T. Talk Edson. He greeted the girl in a bit of shaky tone. I didn't know you were going to be working with Headshot. Yeah, awesome right she smiled back at the boy. We're in the same class. We even partnered up during the sports festival. Ah yes, that's why you look so familiar. The green-haired heroine nodded. We can save the introductions for later. For now, I suggest that we secure these other villains and wait for them to get picked up. Headshot interjected. Agreed. Over the next ten or so minutes, the group did all they could to clean up the crime scene. It wasn't long before the police finally arrived and carted the group of robbers off. The two students made sure to pay extra attention to how the process went for handing off any criminals and how to interact with their peers. Thank you again for showing up, I appreciate it. Headshot repeated. All Blizzard could do was smile at this. It was my pleasure. You know I'm kinda sad I missed all the action. Takage joked while leaning her arm on Midoriya's shoulder, causing the boy to blush. She's so close. Being a hero is more about doing battle with villains and thugs. Ensuring the safety of the bystanders should always be your number one priority. You did well to make sure that the shop owner was safe before joining us. You should take her words to heart, Lizardy. Blizzard is one of the top rescue heroes in the country and ranked 30th for a reason. Hell, she'd be a shoo-in for the top 10 if she put in any effort into her marketing and public image. Headshot said in what everyone assumed to be a joking tone. Stuff like that doesn't interest me anymore. He'll leave the popularity contest to guys like you and All Might. The woman quipped in return. I agree. The masked man said. I may prefer to operate in the shadows, but nowadays. Yo, he'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. So tell me what you want, what you really, really want the man was interrupted by Blizzard's cell phone going off. Excuse me. The woman quickly apologized before pressing the green button on her screen. Go for Blizzard. Hey boss, it's Madoka we have a bit of a situation. An office building collapsed near the mall and we could really use your help. I know you're busy training the rookie but we're out of our depth and people may still be trapped inside the voice of Ozhana said on the other side of the line. A building collapse everyone's ears perked up after hearing this. We're on the way. Thanks. Sorry, but we have a situation near the mall. We have to go. She looked to the masked man. Allow us to come with you. The situation is serious and you could use some extra sets of hands. And I have to repay you for your earlier assistance. Fine, it's only a few minutes away if we fly. I can carry you there. All of a sudden, Midoriya felt the foreign weight place itself onto his back. The boy turned his head to see Takage grinning down at him while wrapping her arms around his shoulders. Well what the hell are we waiting for let's get going. T.T. Takageson. Oh, what's wrong? Dude, are you embarrassed to have a pretty girl ride you? Her grin widened to an almost feral smile as she watched him fumble from her not so subtle innuendo. Even with the helmet on, she could practically see the redness on his cheeks. Lewd comments aside, the girl is right. We need to get going. Are you fine with carrying her, Skywalker? Yes, mum. Then let's get a move on the woman commanded before levitating into the air, grabbing onto her colleague and launching herself towards the sky. Phew, I think she's faster than you mopped up. Takage whistled at the woman's speed. Her and Midoriya may have the same quirk, but she was definitely on a different level. Yeah, well we can't let them leave us behind onward, my steed the lizard tail splitter user shouted while pointing to the sky. All Midoriya could do was let out a slight groan as he took off into the air. Now wasn't the time to get flustered at the thought of having a pretty girl cling to his back like a baby koala. People were in trouble and there was no time to waste. Within a few minutes the group of heroes and interns were at the scene. 
and to say that things didn't look good would be putting it mildly. Like they had been told, there was a building collapse. If there was any consolation to this mess, it was that only half of what they assumed to be some sort of office building was reduced to rubble. The rest was still standing. At the exact same moment, Midoriya and Takage felt a lump appear in their throats at what they were seeing. Holy shit, Takage whispered out in disbelief. Recovery operations seemed to be underway and Midoriya recognized a few of the heroes on the ground from Blizzard's agency. Some were moving rubble into a small clearing while what looked to be a female in a form-fitting variation of a firefighter's uniform was using her quirk to snuff out the remaining flames. You two head over to where the EMTs are and help out. Skywalker, I might you need you to assist in moving the debris. Blizzard ordered. Do whatever the rescue crew says and stay alert. Edshot added. Right the two students nodded before flying over to where the nearby ambulances were located. Once they were on the ground, they could see just how serious the situation was. People in gurneys were being loaded up and there were other injured civilians being treated in a blocked off area. Who are you two? One of the firefighters asked from behind them. We're hero interns. Takage answered. We were told to come over here and help out with whatever we can. Thank goodness. The man said with a slight grin. Do either of you have quirks that can help us move some of these patients were spread pretty thin. I do Midoriya quickly responded. I have telekinesis. I know a bit of first aid, but I'm not an expert. Every little bit helps. The man waved them on. Come over here and help us load this guy onto the gurney. The two greenettes did as they were told and followed the man towards a nearby coffee shop where one of the paramedics had just finished treating a man with what looked like two broken legs on top of spine board. Move this one onto the gurney. Try not to jostle him too much, he has a spinal injury. Got it, the green-haired boy nodded as he held his arms out in front of him. He may not have Yanaga's level of control, but this was well within his capabilities. He took a second to clear his mind before getting to work. As gently as possible, Midoriya lifted the man onto the gurney and set him down without any unnecessary shaking. Once his job was done, the paramedic was quick to strap him down and rush him over to a nearby ambulance. Thank you, young man. The guy placed a hand on his shoulder as he passed by. All right, we still have some people with less severe injuries that need to get bandaged up. You two can help out. Skywalker, get over here Blizzard suddenly called out to Midoriya from above the rubble. The boy hesitated for a moment as he looked back his classmate and the man. Apparently, Takage seemed to be able to read his mind and gave him a quick thumbs up. We got this, right? Midoriya simply said before flying over to where his mentor was. We need to get going, young lady. Come on. Yes, sir. Once Midoriya was next to Blizzard, the woman wasted no time in getting down to business. She pointed over to a nearby mound where the woman from before was pulling the flames from around the area. Once Ember is done snuffing out those fires, the two of us are going to move these rocks. Yes, mum. A few seconds passed before the fire was handled and the woman gave her a thumbs up. Good to go, boss. With that, the two green-haired telekinetics quickly went to work and lifted the rubble into the air. Midoriya himself was able to lift six rather hug pieces closer to the road, but Blizzard moved nearly a third of the mound by herself. The duo spent the next few minutes moving the debris before the woman now identified as Ember shouted at them to stop. There's still someone trapped inside. The two quickly descended upon her position and were met with the sight of young-looking woman crouched underneath a slab of stone. From the looks of it, she was barely a meter away from being crushed by object. He'll lift that slab from above her. Midoriya started to activate his quirk, but was stopped when Blizzard put her hand in front of his face. When dealing with rescue operations it's never a good idea to haphazardly start moving things around. You don't know if disturbing the scene could cause a chain reaction. She told him, Shit, yes yeah, sorry. It's fine, just try and remember that from now on. The green-haired heroine said before turning back to the woman. Mom, are injured? Do you feel any pain? Are you able to move? No, I think I'm okay. She shouted back in a frightened tone. I'm going to levitate you from out of there. Please refrain from any unnecessary movements and do your best to remain calm. Okay. True to her word, Blizzard used her quirk to safely float the woman over to them. She seemed to be perfectly fine other than the layer of grime all over her body, which meant that she must have had a guardian angel looking out for her. Skywalker, please escort her over to the triage area. Me and Ember can take over from here. Yes, Mom. Thank you, Blizzard. You're truly amazing. As long as you're okay, I don't need any thanks. Please follow Skywalker and get yourself checked out. Midoriya was amazed at how composed the woman was in all of this madness. He himself was feeling a bit on edge after seeing all of this chaos, but she was as cool as ice. If he ever needed an example on how a hero should act in a crisis, this was it. The green-haired boy quickly escorted the woman back to where he was standing only a few minutes ago and walked her over to go get looked at by the paramedics. While that was going on, Takage was hard at work assisting wherever she could. She may have had some basic first aid training from Kayama, but now she knew that she needed to brush up on her skills. While Midoriya and his mentor were moving debris, she had spent the last few minutes wrapping bandages and splinting broken bones. The girl typically wasn't a nervous person, but right now she was feeling the pressure of the situation. She was now regretting her earlier comment about not getting to see any action. All right, I think that should do it for now. Thanks, hero. One of the paramedics told her in a relieved tone. I'm just glad I could help. She gave him a short smile. The next 30 minutes were spent cleaning up the area and treating anyone else that was pulled out of the rubble. 
While Blizzard and Midoriya were busy clearing out debris, Edshot was using his quirk to get into tight spaces and search for anyone else that was still trapped. Everything seemed to be going relatively well until Blizzard placed a hand at Boy's shoulder and looked at him with a serious expression. Midori kun I want you to head back over to where your classmate is and stay there until I say otherwise. The boy couldn't help the look of confusion that crossed his face at the woman's words. Sure she was powerful, but with the two of them they would be able to clean things up a lot faster. Bebut, just go, there's something here that I don't want you to see. All he did was nod and fly back over to where Takage was still treating minor injuries before the woman called over to Ember. What's up boss would you send the kid away the purple-eyed woman asked. Instead of a verbal response, Blizzard simply pointed over to a nearby mound. Ember's eyes tracked to where her finger was leading to and her heart almost stopped when she noticed a human arm sticking out from underneath a rather large boulder about 20 meters in front of them. Damn it, it's still too early for the boy to be exposed to something like that. He may be a hero in training, but he's still just a kid. The green-haired woman said in a soft tone, Yeah, I can't argue with you there. Do me a favor and go find a blanket, and let one of the crews know about what we found and send them over here. Yeah, no problem. If Midoriya and Takage ever needed a reality check on just what kind of career field they were aspiring to, then this was definitely it. Once the rescue and the cleanup were finished, it was hard for either of the two students to miss the 17 black bags laying under a makeshift tent in the distance. In truth, with everything going on the possibility of there being any deceased didn't even occur to either of the two teenagers before seeing it for themselves. Luckily neither of them were subjected to having to bear witness to what shape those unfortunate souls were in before being covered up but that did little to brighten their moods. Man, talk about one hell of a first day. Takage let out while sitting down on the curb. Yeah, an equally dejected Midoriya agreed while taking the spot next to her and removing his helmet. I guess this is the kind of thing we're gonna have to get used to once we go pro. Looks that way. Headshot and Blizzard must be used to this kind of thing by now. It's kind of crazy, how huh? seeing it on the news is one thing, but being right here in the thick of it is a whole different monster. No kidding. Still, you seem to be a pretty big help out there. The girl gave him a bit of a smirk. So were you. He turned to her with a slight grin of his own. You did a good job helping out and treating those injuries. You said that you've had first aid training before. Yeah, Aunt Nimari and my dad taught me some stuff, but nothing official. It was mainly because of how my quirk works but also because it's a valuable skill to have. That makes a lot of sense. If you want, I could teach you a thing or two. Yeah, I'll just have to pay a small fee. She said with a slightly joking tone. In her opinion, it was best to lighten up the mood whenever possible. And right now is as good a time as any. On what is that? Hey, I don't know. He'll think of something later. Just before he could respond, the two students were called over by Edshot, Blizzard and Ember who were making their way over to them. Now that they weren't in the middle of a rescue operation, Midoriya was finally able to take in the purple-eyed woman's appearance. She looked to be the same height as him, but she had a considerable level of muscle on her body. What's up rookie we haven't had the chance to formally introduce ourselves yet. I'm Madoka Ozhana, but I go by Ember when I'm on duty. It's nice to meet you. The boy bowed. Ember here recently transferred over to my agency, but she's very good at what she does. She spends most of her time working with the local fire departments where her quirk is most useful. Yeah, I'll be seeing her around quite a bit during your stay. Blizzard explained. That's pretty cool. What's your quirk if you don't mind me asking? I call it flame control. I can't create fires, but I can control them. I mostly use it to snuff out flames that are too hard to get under control. Ember said. That's pretty useful for rescue operations. Takage commented. Indeed. Headshot was next to voice his opinion. You two did a good job in assisting the recovery and cleanup. I'm sorry you had to be exposed to such a thing on your first day, but this is the type of work you have to get used to if you want to become a pro. We understand, sir. Good. Blizzard smiled. Me and Edshot were talking and we think it would be best if we cut our patrol short for the day and rest up at the agency. We wanted to talk to you about what happened here. Speaking of which, a lizard tail splitter user interjected. What caused the building to collapse? From the information that we were told, it was a suicide bomber. A chill went down the two teenagers' spines after hearing that. Villains' attacks were pretty common nowadays, but this was in the category of actual terrorism. Sure, attacks such as this weren't as frequent as they were in the past. But the fact that it happened was a bit alarming. The police have everything under control so there's nothing more for us to do. We'll be heading back to Blizzard's agency to cool off and discuss how well proceed from here. What do you mean Midoriya tilted his head in confusion? The two of us have been talking and we think it would be a good idea to team up for the remainder of your internships. Whatever training needs to be done will be conducted in the mornings and then we'll meet up in the afternoons to join forces. Seriously the two greenettes blurted out simultaneously. It's a better way for you students to get some more experience and teaming up is more efficient. Sure, most pros prefer to go solo nowadays, but it never hurts to learn from two heroes rather than one. We'll discuss this further back at the agency over a meal. For now, we should get going. Do you want to come with us? Ember Blizzard asked her partner. No, I'm heading back over to the station just in case another call comes in before the end of my shift. He'll be back later. The purple-eyed woman replied. Good, he'll see you later. Blizzard smiled before levitating off the ground and floating headshot by her side. 
prompting Takage to resume her earlier position and jump on Midoriya's back. Except this time, the boy didn't even bother fighting it. With one last wave, the group of four made their back to agency for some much-needed rest and relaxation. Back at the agency, the group had just made their way into the building. Takage was admittedly impressed with the overall layout of the place and how extravagant everything looked. Headshot's agency had the whole ninja vibe, but Blizzard's had more of modern Japanese feel to it. Once inside, the four of them went to the green-haired woman's office and wasted no time digging into their prepared meals. For Midoriya and Takage, seeing the number 5 hero without his signature mask was quite the shock. They were certain that tabloids across the country would pay top dollar to get a snapshot of the guy in his current state. At least now they could say that they were part of the select few who got to see it in person. This food is wonderful, Blizzard. Please give my compliments to the chef, Kamahara said in between bites. He'll be sure to pass the word on. Katsuragi smiled. Yeah, the food is amazing, Takage added. Thank you. So, you and Midori Kun are classmates. Sure are. Well, the fact that you two know each other should be beneficial for the duration of this week. It's fortunate that we ran into each other. Yeah, Midoriya nervously nodded. You certainly left quite an impression during the sports festival, midoriya -san. You completely routed Endeavor's son and Ingenium's little brother. I wouldn't be surprised if you received offers from a few of the heroes in the top ten. Two did. The boy admitted. A few of the top heroes sent me a request, but this was the best place for me to come. I agree. The silver-haired man nodded. Your match against that Bakugou boy was also quite the spectacle. Takage noticed the way the boy's hands seemed to tense up at the mention of his fight with Bakugou. She knew it was a bit of a sore spot for him, so she quickly tried to think up a way to change the topic. However, Katsuragi was first to speak. Yes, Midori-kun did put on a good display. He showcased his talents and performed rather admirably if I do say so myself. Word on the street is that Best Genus took on that Bakugou boy as an intern. I know he has a track record for reforming troubled youths, but he might have his hands full with that one. Did you see the way he had to be chained up like some wild beast? Yes, it was rather unsettling to look at. Midoriya had to wonder if he was transported to some alternate reality. Were there actually people who didn't approve of Bakugou's behavior this may have been the first time in his entire life that he's heard an adult not outright praise the boy for simply being amazing. Maybe there was some hope for this world after all. The guy's total asset. Everyone in our class pretty much agrees that Moptop should've won. Takage smiled at her green-haired companion. All Midoriya could do was blush at what he felt was an undeserved compliment, prompting the girl to let out a quick laugh at seeing him get flustered. SSO, how has your internship been going so far? The boy deflected. Pretty good. Headshot gave me a valuable lesson this morning on what to do when it comes to using my quirk in a fight. I already have a couple ideas on how I can improve that imaging to try out. I'm glad to see that you're taking my lessons to heart and already thinking of ways to apply them. What about you guys? Me and Fubikusen had a sparring match earlier this morning. It was over pretty quickly. I honestly didn't stand a chance. That must have been something to see. Takage was curious how a match between the two of them would look. Usually, the boy could rely on his flying to stay out of everyone's reach. But based on what she saw earlier, Katsuragi was more than a match for him. In her mind, she imagined some type of aerial battle with random objects flying all over the place. Don't sell yourself short, Midori Kun, you're very talented. The fact that you can fly so expertly at your age is something to be proud of. It's a skill that very few people with quirks like ours can obtain and even then it's not an easy one to master. To be honest, he reminds a bit of your older sister. I can still remember her zipping through the air like a rocket while taking down criminals. I doubt that even Hawks could match her in terms of speed. Kamahara joked. Suddenly, the green-haired woman's expression shifted ever so slightly from a smile into a bit of frown. It took a second, but the silver-haired man quickly realized his verbal folly and immediately apologized for bringing up the topic up. I apologize, Blizzard. I know your sister's disappearance must still be hard on you. You could practically feel the energy in the entire room shift for a brief moment. The two students were well aware of the story behind the heroine in question. Well, lack of story would be a better description. As far as they knew, one day the former number four heroine simply vanished. In the two years since she's been gone, not a single trace of her had been found. There was no doubt in Midoriya's mind that something like that was hard on a family member, especially since he had an idea of how what kind of effect it could have. Don't worry yourself over it. The woman waved off. But you are correct, if anything Midoriya Kun has the potential to be just as strong as she was. Once he fine-tunes his quirk a bit, he'll be a force to be reckoned with. Hearing that made the boy's heart flutter a little bit. The idea of him being in the same ring as Tornado was almost inconceivable in his mind. But hearing those words come from the person who probably knew her the best forced a bit redness onto his cheeks. Oh man, that's some pretty high praise there mopped up. I can agree with that assessment. But takage also has the potential to be a top-ranked hero herself. I'm sure that once she finds more uses for her quirk, she'll be trouble for anyone that dares cross her path. Kamahara added while looking to his student. Oh stop it, you're gonna make me blush. The girl feigned embarrassment while silently hoping he would praise her a bit more. The group spent the next hour chit-chatting and going over their schedule for the remainder of the week. 
Once things were finally set in stone, Kamahara and Takage decided to take their leave so that they could get an early start on the next day. But before their departure, the girl took the opportunity to have one last conversation with her friend. In totally looking forward to tomorrow partner she said with a toothy smirk while throwing an arm over his shoulder. Yeah, I wanted to hang out with you a bit more and now we get the chance to work together for the rest of the week. Isn't that sweet? Yeah, you're right. It'll be good to be around a classmate during the week. And you get the pleasure of being my personal mode of transportation. Isn't that great Izuku she further teased by doing her best Kayama impersonation and adding a slight bit of sultriness into her voice. Takage was quick to notice the confused look on his face at hearing her call him by his first name and gave a quick giggle. Would I call all my friends by their first names? Or do you actually prefer Mop Top? You really think of me as a friend he whispered in a weird tone. Somewhere between shock and confusion. Why wouldn't I we've already hung out and you're a pretty cool guy? Was her reply. Admittedly, she was a bit surprised at hearing that. She knew the guy didn't have a lot of friends but it wasn't that weird was it? Oh, I swear, one of these days I'll get you to come out of that shell of yours. The whole mystery boy sh tick is cool and all, but you're way too cute for that. Midoriya's face quickly heated up and Takage had to stop herself from passing out with how hard she started laughing. Eventually the girl and her mentor made their exit, leaving the boy to rewire his brain after once again being on the receiving end of her teasing. She seems really into you, Katsuragi suddenly said, causing the boy to remember that the woman was still behind him. Assess she just am messing around. He quickly retorted while turning away from the woman. I'm not too sure about that. What do you mean? Oh nothing the woman said while trying to suppress a smile. I suggest you hurry and get some rest. We're starting your training bright and early tomorrow morning. What are going to do? We're going to work on your control. I noticed a few things while you were helping me out with the recovery operation and we should address them as soon as possible. So be prepared. Was all she told him before turning around and making her way towards the elevator. Yes, mom the boy gave her a polite boy. Midoriya had no clue what was in store for him tomorrow morning but he had a sneaking suspicion that he wasn't going to enjoy whatever his mentor had planned. Waking up before sunrise was something that Midoriya had grown accustomed to by this point in his life. During his training and preparation to get into UA, he would often spend the early hours of the morning at Dagaba Beach. Granted, the fact that he didn't have to worry about going to school during that time certainly helped his early morning routine quite a bit. As he walked into the bathroom to wash his face and brush his teeth, the boy paused to look himself over in the full-sized mirror on the nearby wall. Months of intense weightlifting and physical training had done wonders for his growing body. Not only did he grow a couple of centimeters in height, he now had a decent amount of muscle on his once slender frame that would put his former self to shame. I'm glad I sold all of my old All Might junk to pay for that gym membership. He told himself while taking a couple of seconds to flex in mirror. He knew that he had to look like one of those garden variety douchebags that Yao'd see flaunting their bodies on television. And he'd be mortified if anyone ever caught him doing something like this. But Midoriya couldn't help himself from admiring how far he had come. He may not have been as muscular as Tetsu Tetsu or even Bondo, but he still had a respectable physique. However, there was one thing that the boy absolutely hated about his body, and that was his scars. The right side of his hip and abdomen was littered with dozens of well-placed, symmetrical lines that he had carved into his own body over the last two years or so. A constant reminder to himself about the person he once was. The boy can still remember the very first time he drew a blade across his skin and the feeling of euphoria that came with it. But aside from his slip-up at the start of the year, those moments were very few and far between nowadays. Yet there was one mark on his body that made him cringe every single time he laid eyes on it. The still visible burn mark on his right shoulder in the shape of a handprint. The scar in question was a constant reminder of what he still considers to be the worst day of his life. And it was destined to plague him for the rest of his days. No matter what he did, the thing seemed determined to stay on his form. He had tried everything ointments, makeup, topical gels, there was even a point where he considered just outright cutting the piece of skin completely off his body altogether. Eventually he just accepted it for what it was and used it as a constant reminder to never let things get as bad as they once were. Thankfully, he had been able to keep this a secret from his mother and everyone else. The last thing he needed was for this to ruin his chances of becoming a hero. With one last visual inspection, Midoriya went on with his morning routine before heading down to the kitchen area and making himself a light breakfast. He was looking forward to whatever training his mentor had planned for him, and he was determined to do his best. Super friends created Itsuka Kendu, Ibarra Shizaki, Ponitsu Notori, Tetsu 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 Tetsu, Juzo Honuki, Izuku Midoriya and Ryaiko Yanagi have been added to the chat. T-Rex, what's up party people? Dumbbell, did you seriously name this group Super Friends? T-Rex, problem. Dumbbell, yes. Cross, greetings everyone. Fist, so is there a reason why you only added us into this chat and not the entire class? T-Rex, you guys are pretty much the only people in class that I actually talk to. Skeleton, makes sense. Skeleton, how's everyone's internships going? T-Rex, awesome. Fist, same. Cross, I've learned quite a bit in only one day. Dumbbell, pretty good, but kind of boring. Apple, very fun. Ghost, good. Rabbit, good. Skeleton, who are you guys interning with anyway I didn't get the chance to ask before we all left. 
Bembel, in with fourth kind. Kirishima from 1A is here too. T-Rex, oh yeah, that guy with the same quirk as you. What's it like? Dumbbell, he's pretty cool, but the guy keeps talking about manliness. It's kind of weird. Pross, in working with Kamui Woods. He's been a pleasure to learn under. Fist, gunhead for me. We pretty much hit the ground running. He's actually really nice. Apple, Mount Lady. Me and Ibarra combined together yesterday with our pros. Ghost, in with Yorai Musha. Skeleton, the number 8 hero holy shit that dude's ancient. Cross, language. Ghost, he said that my quirk has a lot of practical uses and has shown me a few interesting tricks. It's been very informative. T-Rex, that's still pretty awesome though. In with Edge Shot. Me and Mopped Up are actually teaming up for the rest of the week. Skeleton, that's pretty cool. T-Rex, we actually got to help with a rescue operation yesterday. Fist, what happened I saw on the news that a building got blown up near where you guys are at. T-Rex, from what we were told it was Suicide Bomber. Cross, how dreadful. There were a couple of similar incidents in a few other places from what I've read. Apple, super crazy. Fist, well I'm glad you guys are alright. Skeleton, seriously. Dumbbell, as much fun as it talking to you guys I gotta run. Me and Kirishima have to spend the morning picking up trash at the park with fourth kind. Dumbbell, T-Rex, in playing the world's smallest violin. Cross, same, I have to get ready for the day as well. Fist, yeah me too. Ghost, agreed. Rabbit, same. T-Rex, good point. T-Tile, Apple, have fun. Skeleton, talk to you guys later. Go out and do great things plus ultra and all that. Midoriya knew that his early morning training session was going to be tough. But he certainly wasn't expecting this. The boy and his mentor had hit the ground running as soon as they arrived at the junkyard not too long after breakfast. Like Katsuragi had told him the night before, their main focus for today was his control. Midoriya was given the task of reshaping various pieces of metal while simultaneously floating in the air. On the surface, it seemed pretty simple but that certainly wasn't the case. The green-haired woman upped the ante by telling him that every single time his feet hit the ground, he would over 50 push-ups. And he was already on 500 in the first 90 minutes. According to Katsuragi, the best way to improve his time in the air was just by powering through it as long as possible. And with each attempt it became increasingly difficult to maintain. That coupled with the added chore of manipulating pipes into various shapes was pushing him to his limits. Thankfully, the woman was merciful enough to grant him a breather from his training. How are you feeling Katsuragi asked the boy after creating a comfortable looking chair from some of the nearby scrap metal and a car door. Good. He responded with a heavy sigh and a film of sweat on his forehead. I know it sucks, but this is the best way to improve your flying. Think of it like weightlifting, the harder you push yourself the easier it will get over time. I understand. For now, I want to focus on your how many objects you can control at once. You said your limit was six, right? Yes, mom. The green-haired heroine looked at him for a moment before reaching into her backpack and pulling out a box of spoons from one of the pockets and setting them on the ground in front of him. Midoriya tilted his head in curiosity at what she was planning for him to do. Lift up as many of those as you can. She ordered while leaning forward in her seat. The boy did as he was told and one beyond lifted six of the spoons off the ground and levitating them in front of his face. I thought so. She commented. What is it? Tell me. When you did that did you try to lift each spoon up one beyond? Yeah. He nodded. Well that's your problem. Huh. Katsuragi proceeded to lift the rest of the spoons into the air, 24 separate ones in total. Needless to say, Midoriya was pretty amazed by this. He thought that Yanaga's control was impressive, but this was in a whole other league. There's a trick to handling bigger loads that my sister taught me when I was still in middle school. To be honest, I can only manipulate 10 different items if I focus on them individually. But there's a way to work around that. The woman began explaining. What is it he asked? Instead of focusing on each object individually, try moving them in one giant cluster. You won't be able to freely manipulate each object on their own, but it's a useful way to move heavy loads. I noticed yesterday that you were limiting yourself but this is how I work around stuff like that. Midoriya took a couple of seconds to jot down in his quirk analysis, Izuku Midoriya notebook before turning his attention back to the kitchen utensils. In his mind, it made a lot of sense. Up until this point he had been strictly focused on moving objects one by one. He assumed that over time he would be able to gradually increase his limit and that method had been working so far. But this just made a lot more sense. No wonder the woman was able to lift such massive loads during the recovery operation. Alright the boy half shouted with a determined look on his face while focusing on the spoons. Midoriya took a moment to clear his mind and put her words into action. Over the course of the next minute or so, he tried his hardest to move all of them at once, but the most he was able to do was barely lift the set of kitchen utensils off the ground. Eventually, he gave up and let himself take a couple of breaths. You are still focusing on each individual spoon. The green-haired woman stated while readjusting herself in the makeshift chair. Try this. Inside your mind, imagine your quirk as one giant ball around the spoons. Picture some type of force field surrounding the spoons and use that method as a way to move them. Luke, once again, the boy brought his attention back to the spoons and put Katsuraga's words into action. Inside of his head, he imagined a ball just big enough to encompass the kitchen utensils and placed it around them. Admittedly, it was hard trying to get the picture inside of his head. 
but once he was able to do it, Midoriya successfully levitated the entire group off the ground and in front of his face. Like his mentor previously stated it was impossible to move any individual spoon by itself, but he was able to float them around in one singular group relatively easily. That was as hard as I thought it would be. Midoriya thought to himself only seconds before the entire cluster dropped. Apparently, something like this required a lot of control to maintain. Losing focus for even half a second broke his hold on them. This kid is amazing. Katsuragi smiled at her student's progress. She half expected him to fail on the first try like she did when she first learned of this method. You truly are talented Midoriya-kun. You have a much better grasp on your power than I did at your age. I'm surprised you weren't able to do something like already. While I haven't had my quirk for very long so I'm still learning how to apply it. The boy absent-mindedly replied before clasping a hand over his mouth. Damn it. The green-haired heroine tilted her head and gave him a confused look after hearing that. What do you mean? Midoriya was now mentally kicking himself for letting that information slip. He had been doing well so far and not letting anyone know that he's had his quirk for less than a year. But now he just messed up big time. Seeing as he now couldn't take his words back, the boy decided to just roll with it and stick to his usual story. UWW well, I'm kind of a late bloomer. My quirk didn't manifest until a little under a year ago. Seriously Katsuragi inquired. She was by no means an expert on quirks, but developing one so late was a rarity. That's odd, with how strong you are I would've assumed you've had it your entire life. Yeah, I was pretty surprised at myself when it finally came in. Wow so you thought you were quirkless all that time I'm sorry to hear that. She said in a somber tone. The woman was well aware of how those without quirks were treated in today's society. If their suicides rates were any indication, then the boy must had it rough growing up. Yeah, growing up wasn't really all that great. In any case, that just makes you even more impressive in my eyes. Having your quirk for less than a year and already being able to do as much as you can is nothing short of amazing. It took me years to learn how to fly at your level. Before that, I could barely keep myself in the air for a few minutes without falling on my face. Midoriya felt his heart flutter a bit at Katsuragi's praise. Being complimented like this was something that he didn't think he'll ever really get used to. But it still felt good to have his hard work acknowledged. He was about to tell her thank you, but something that she said finally clicked in his mind. Wait, so you were pretty much unable to fly before then? Not entirely. What do you mean? I learned a neat little trick to move through the air when I was still in high school. She told him before standing up and calling another broken car door over to her. Midoriya watched as the woman jumped on top of it and began moving through the area with an impressive amount of skill. If he had to make a comparison, it was like the woman was snowboarding. This was his first time seeing her do something like that. I call it air surfing. I don't really do this a lot nowadays since I've improved my mobility. But it still has its uses. If anything, you can use whatever you ride on as an extra weapon to take down criminals. Wow, was all the boy managed to say. Something like this was definitely useful to use. As his mind began running over all the practical applications of this a thought popped into his head. If someone with a quirk similar to theirs knew how to do this, then it could help them out tremendously when battling villains. Ah, uh, Fubikissin. Hmm, would it be okay if I told one of my classmates about this I think it would help her out a lot. Fine with me, it's not like I have it trademarked or anything. Thank you. You can tell her about it after we're done here. For now, your break is over so let's get back to it. We only have a few hours before we need to meet up with Ed Shot and Takageson and there's still a few things that I want to teach you. Yes mom the boy almost cheered as the green-haired duo resumed their reigning from earlier. While Midoriya was hard at work improving on his skill set, Takage was doing the same. The green-haired girl was currently taking a knee on the ground while lightly painting with a not so subtle amount of sweat on her face. Do you need to take a breather Kamahara asked her and with a slight bit of concern in his voice. No, I'm good to go again. She shook her head before reactivating her quirk and spreading herself out across the room and around her mentor. Alright, but after this we're taking a break. The number 5 hero watched as various pieces of his students slowly began rotating around him. There were still quite a few openings in this new move of hers. But considering the fact that she thought of it just yesterday, he was impressed with how far she had come along. The idea itself was simple but very effective once put into practice. Scale storm as the girl called it, was a move where she would separate herself into as many pieces as possible and use them to surround her opponent. This, along with rotating herself at top speed would not only distract whoever got caught up in the attack, it would also stop them from escaping. Her one-sided match with the pro yesterday showed Takage that she couldn't rely on brute force and cheap tricks as much as she would like when it came to a fight. She needed a way to contain people and take them out. This is good. Kamahara commented as Takage's body began rotating her pieces faster and faster. A little more fine-tuning and this would be a problem for anyone. Damn, this is still too hard to maintain for long the girl's floating head thought from above the whirlwind of flesh. Moving her body like this in one direction was pretty easy, but the first issue came with stamina. And the fact that she had been doing this for the last hour wasn't helping at all. I just need to wait for an opening. Luckily for the girl, her wish had been granted when Kamahara turned his head. As fast as she could, Takage focused on one of her forearms and sent it towards the pro hero's gut. 
but like all the times before, he was easily able to dodge it. With that failed attack, Takage had officially hit her limit and pieced her body back together, a girl flopping down on the ground to catch her breath. Damn it, she groaned in annoyance. The moment before you attack you slow down a considerable amount. It's a good indicator that you're about to strike. Yeah, I know she responded. Part 2 of this new move of hers is where the real issue came. Moving her body in one direction was easy enough, but trying to send things in different directions was a challenge. She may have complete control over all of her pieces, but doing something like that was almost as bad as trying to look both left and right at the same time. The last time she tried something like that she caused herself a headache due to the information overload. Still, this is quite remarkable. In my opinion if you just to practice it a bit more, it won't be long before it's perfected. Thanks. She gave the man a tired smile. Let's take 10 minutes so you can recover. It's not a good idea to tire yourself out before going on patrol this afternoon. He said while taking up a spot on the ground a couple of meters in front of her. The silver-haired man let the silence linger a bit longer before striking up a conversation with her. So talk agents and tell me, what inspired you to become a hero? The grinette racked her brain for a moment as she tried to find the right words. Well it's just something that I've always wanted to do in O. I guess like most kids, I grew up watching heroes save people and wanted to that. That's understandable. Don't get me wrong, I'm not like those guys who just want to go out and beat people up. I mean I guess that's part of the reason why I want to go into rescue work. I'd rather leave all that flashy stuff to guys like you and All Might. Ah yes, you did mention that your end goal was to be a rescue hero. The man nodded while taking a sip from his teacup that magically appeared from out of nowhere. Why that route and not the more congenital your quirk is perfect for fighting in my opinion. Yeah that's what people have been telling me, but that's just not what I want to do. The girl let out with a bit of a sigh. I just want to save people at the end of the day. And yesterday was kind of an eye-opener on how much I need to improve if I want to be an effective rescue hero. It's quite refreshing to hear that from someone your age. Most kids just want a reason to use their quirks freely and gain attention. Not many go into the hero business with noble intentions. Oh yeah, you don't have to tell me twice. She flashed the man a toothy smirk. Takage wasn't one to judge people's motivations for aspiring to become a hero. But there are always people out there who join the career field with less than desirable intentions. Well if you ask me, I think you can become an effective rescue hero. Try to remember that nothing about this job is cut and dry. People like Blizzard and 13 may be able to handle massive jobs and natural disasters. But not every situation requires something so flashy. I understand, sir. Good. The man smiled underneath his mask as he stood up. I say we hold off on practicing your move for now and take. Some time for me to show you some good ways to distract an opponent during a battle. Sounds good to me Takage cheered before jumping to her feet and giving the man a wide grin. It almost seemed like a perfect day when the group of heroes and interns finally met up for their afternoon outing. The sun was shining, the temperature was perfect and there was just enough cloud cover to provide a comfortable bit of shade. The group of four wasted no time getting to work and spent the first hour patrolling their agreed-upon route. There were quite a few people out and about today, and there was no shortage of cheers and greetings from fans and passerbys. We love you Edshot. You too Blizzard. Who are those other two? I think I recognize that girl from the UA. Sports festival. Oh yeah, her quirk is wild as hell. I don't recognize that masked guy though. Maybe he's Blizzard new sidekick. Takage decided to bask in the moment and gave the onlookers a quick wave and a smile. Fame wasn't her number one priority when it comes to becoming a hero. But it certainly felt good to get recognized. Midori on the other hand was glad that no one could see his face under his helmet. Otherwise they would've seen the notable amount of blush on his freckled cheeks. It's kind of weird having a bunch of random people know who you are. Takage said as they turned the corner. I agree, but it's something that y'all have to get used to. Headshot told her. Remember to not let stuff like this go to your head. Blizzard was the next to speak. A lot of young heroes get too wrapped up in the fame that comes with our line of work. He'll admit that after my debut I got pretty overwhelmed with all of the attention. Oh yeah, I remember that. Midoriya stated. It was about five years ago when the green-haired heroine made her splash onto the hero scene. She and Tornado saved a group of 200 passengers stranded on a sinking ship in Tokyo Bay. It was pretty big news story for a few weeks and was the event that earned the siblings the title of Psychic Sisters. Yes, it was my first big job after graduating from UA. If I remember correctly, I only had my pro hero license for about a month when that happened. Wow, I didn't know you went to UA. Takage looked to the woman. I don't remember ever seeing you participate in the sports festival. I wouldn't doubt it. It was a few years ago, and the furthest I ever got was the semifinals in the tournament stage in my second year. I guess him the odd one out. The silver-haired man joked. Where do you go to school at, sir? I went to Ketsubatsu. Your homeroom teacher Vlad King went there around the same time I did if I remember correctly. Wow, small world. The lizard tail splitter user laughed. Just before anyone else could comment, a loud scream from about 80 meters in front of them caught their attention. The group looked ahead to see a young man dressed in school uniform sprinting out of a nearby alley. 
The boy had jet black hair styled in a bowl cut and pink eyes, and from the looks of it, he was in a hurry. Is that Midoriya thought once the recognition set in. Before he called out the person's name, a group of students in similar uniforms came from the same alleyway with a set of sadistic looks on their faces. Get back here you freak a girl with red hair shouted at the boy. What the hell is Goy Edshot's inquiry was cut off when Midoriya suddenly flew past him and made a beeline straight for the boy. Skywalker Blizzard called out. In the blink of an eye, the green-haired boy was already down the road and called out to the person being chased. An Ohanesson. The black-haired teen looked up and a sense of relief washed over his features at the sight of this unknown hero. Help these guys are after me he shouted in desperation. Midoriya wasted no time and activated his quirk on the group of pursuers. The boy lifted the four of them off the ground and held them in place just before they could get within arm's reach of their target. Hey, what the hell's the big idea the redhead said while trying to break free of his hold? Thank you hero. The boy now identified as Anohana bowed at Midoriya with a shaky grin. Are you alright, Anohanesan? You know me the black-haired boy tilted his head in confusion before the voice finally registered in his head. Wait, are you Mido? What's going on here Blizzard asked as her and the others ran up to group. The green-haired woman wanted to be mad at her student for jumping into a situation without a second thought. But she was impressed at how fast he reacted to getting to someone in trouble. As she took a moment to look over the group of students, she couldn't help but notice the layer of dirt on Anohana's uniform. That along with what looked like green liquid seeping down from his hair. Explain. These guys were chasing me. I barely managed to shake them a few blocks ago but they kept coming after me. Oh really now Edshot folded his arms while looking to airborne students. He's lying a boy with green scales on his face retorted. So why don't you enlighten us on what's going on? A nervous sweat suddenly formed on their faces as they tried to think of an excuse. Teeth that loser bumped into me and spilled my smoothie. And then he took off without even apologizing. You don't really expect us to believe that, do you Takaj asked after hearing such an obvious lie. It's the truth. Like hell it is Anohana shouted back. That jerk with the scales on his face threw it on me after we got out of school and then they all started chasing me. They have been coming after me ever since the school year started. Shut up, you damn freak. I suggest you lower your tone before I get angry. Blizzard snapped at the redhead, causing the girl to clamp her mouth shut. Will someone please tell us what really started this whole mess? These guys have been coming after me ever since school started. They are just a bunch of bullies who think it's okay to pick on the quirkless kid. Everything seemed to stop for a moment as the group of heroes processed the boy's words. Based on what they had just been told, along with his appearance, it was safe to assume that this wasn't too far from the truth. Takaj immediately felt something well up in her chest and she had to stop herself from making a comment. While that was happening, Midoriya chose to stay silent. You know, this could be considered assault if the police were to get involved. If he wanted to, this boy could press charges on all of you and Yao'd face some serious consequences. Blizzard spoke. You're going to believe this guy instead of us. We have no reason not to. The masked man interjected. The optics are rather incriminating. This boy does look to be roughed up a bit while you children don't. If I didn't know any better, I'd he say more than just a simple accidental collision took place. If he were to press charges, I wouldn't blame him. The group of students all stayed silent while giving each other a set of concerned looks. They were smart enough to realize that the situation didn't look good for them and the last thing they wanted was to go to jail for committing a crime. What do you say? An Ohana. Well, an Ohanesson, what do you think we should do with these hooligans? The boy looked at his classmates for a moment before letting out a heavy sigh. As much as I want to, it's not like anything will actually happen to them besides a slap on the wrist. As long as they are not chasing me then I'm fine. Something about the way he said that seemed loaded to Takage. Sure she doubted that this group of jerks would face hard time for something as simple as this. But why did he think that nothing was going to happen to them this Anohana guy was obviously the victim here. Well today is your lucky day. Well let you off with a warning. T thanks Ed shot. The scaled teen said. However, we will be getting all of your names and what school you go to. I have a few contacts with the local precinct and they'll make sure that they keep an ear to the ground and I will personally be following up on this. If I hear anything about the four of you in the future, you better believe that there will be hell to pay. Blizzard followed up with an intense glare. While the two heroes were getting the students' information Midoriya and Takage were helping Anohana wipe the dirt off his uniform. Although she was glad that they were able to resolve the situation quickly, the girl was a bit annoyed that those jerks were pretty much getting off scot-free. That should be all of it. Are you sure that you're okay Midoriya asked in a concerned voice. Yeah I'm used to it. Thanks Midoriya-kun. The boy waved off after wiping the last bit of liquid from his hair. Seeing as there was no point in keeping it on, Midoriya elected to remove his helmet so that the boy could see his face. You know each other Takaj asked in a curious tone. Yeah Anohana smiled. Midoriya kun volunteers at the orphanage that I live at. He helps me out all the time when I'm having trouble with English. Really Takaj glanced at her classmate. Yeah, he's the best he's always helping out with chores and stuff too. Dude, I didn't know that you were going to be in this area. I remember you saying that you were going to be busy with your internship this week, but you didn't tell me that you would be working with Blizzard of all people. Two guess I forgot to em mention it. Midoriya slightly blushed. Wow Moptop, you really are made of puppies and sunshine. The girl laughed. 
Thanks again for helping me out man, you really saved my ass. It was no trouble at all, really. So do those guys come after you like that all the time? Unfortunately, the boy sighed. They've been on my case ever since middle school. All because you don't have a quirk. That and I get way better grades than they do. They were mad because I messed up the grading curve on our last exam and one of them isn't doing too hot in class. It just comes with the territory, you know the boy chuckled a bit before extending out his hand. I haven't gotten the chance to properly introduce myself, Im Sasuke and Ohana. It's nice to meet you. As Takage went to shake the boy's hand she noticed two things. The first was the smile that he had on his face. It was the same kind of smile that Midoriya had given her a couple of times during school. The kind that a person gives you when they are not being truly honest. The second was the one that made her pause for a brief moment. When she looked at the boy's hand, under his sleeve she noticed the series of clean-looking cuts on the underside of wrist. Takage had to hold in a gasp at the sight of this and did her best to pretend like she hadn't noticed. I am Satsuna Takage, mopped up here as my classmate. Seriously that's awesome. So have you two known each other for long? The two boys shared a quick look with one another and seemed to have some type of silent conversation right before her very eyes. Takage couldn't help but notice the slight bit of tension in the air before the black-haired teen answered her question. We ran into each other a while back. HHE helped me out and I've been volunteering at the orphanage ever since. Midoriya added on. Thankfully, the boy didn't go any further than that short explanation. Cool. Well, thanks for helping out back there. Sorry you guys had to go through all the trouble on my account. I know heroes are super busy and all. It's what heroes are supposed to do after all. Blizzard spoke up after the two heroes rejoined the group. Well, I need to hurry up before I miss my train. He'll see you around, Midoriya-kun. Thanks again for all the help. Yeah, he'll see you later. The green-haired teen waved. With that, Anohana made his way down the street in the direction of the train station. Midoriya was still worried about the boy's safety. But he put that to the side for now and made a mental note to contact him after their patrol was done just made sure that he was okay. After a quick chat about what happened, the group of heroes and students went on with their duties for the day. For the remainder of the afternoon, Takage couldn't help but notice how quiet Midoriya was being. Obviously something about that whole interaction seemed to be bothering him. But the girl elected to hold off on talking to him about until later that day. Whip, how's your internship going? T-Rex, awesome we just got finished with our patrol. Headshot's just as cool as I thought he'd be and I've already come up with a new move. Whip, well, I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. Although I'm still a bit heartbroken that you didn't accept my offer. Whip, but if you don't want to spend time with me I understand. Whip, T-Rex, save the alligator tears for dad when you want him to make teriyaki salmon. Whip, you're so mean. T-Rex, plus, I couldn't just not accept an offer from the number 5 hero. I need to expand my worldview if I'm going to become a pro. T-Rex, oh yeah, we're also teaming up with Moptop and Blizzard for the rest of the week. Pretty awesome, right? Whip, oh dear you finally get to spend some quality time with your boy doy outside of class how interesting. Whip, just make sure you use protection if you get into any trouble. Whip, or don't. Whip, it is more fun that way. T-Rex, speaking from personal experience. Whip, quite the mouth you have there young lady. T-Rex, I learn from the best. T-Rex, divided by. Whip, indeed. Whip, well I just wanted to check up on you. Stay safe and don't do anything I wouldn't. T-Rex, that leaves me a lot of gray area to work with. Whip, such sassiness. T-Rex, T-Tile. Whip, have fun. Once their hero duties for the day were done, the group chose to relax for a bit back the Blizzard Agency. Katsuragi and Kamahara both decided to give their students a break while they filed the last bit of paperwork for all the jobs that they managed to complete. This respite was exactly what Takage needed to get some alone time with her favorite green-haired cinnamon roll of classmate. The two brunettes were currently lounging in the agency's rest area while snacking on some fruit they got from the cafeteria. Never one to miss an opportunity, the girl made sure to sit as close to him as possible on the large green sofa. Not so much so that they would be touching, but enough to ruffle his feathers a bit. Pretty fun day today, how she asked him while taking a sip of her water. Yeah. He nervously nodded. So do you mind if I ask you a question? Go ahead. It's about that orphanage that you go to. Is everyone there quirkless? The boy hesitated for a brief moment before recomposing himself. Yeah. Oh, all right. The girl nodded as she leaned back on the sofa. This was enough to confuse Midoriya. He was certain that Takage was going to try and dig a little deeper into it, but apparently that wasn't the case. Is that all you wanted to know? Oh, believe me, I definitely have a few more questions. But I can see that you're not really comfortable talking about it. But I'm assuming that you spending so much time there has something to do with Bakugou calling you quirkless loser in school that day. All Midoriya could do was laugh and try to play it off as best he could. Part of him was thankful that the girl wasn't going to pry into things any more than that. But another part knew that she was going to ask him about it sooner or later. Still, it's pretty awesome that you tutor those kids though. That an Ohana guy seemed like he really appreciated it. To be honest, English is probably the only subject that he struggles in. He's a genius when it comes to everything else. He actually goes to a really nice school in this area and might get a chance to go to college early. Good for him. I'm sure with you helping him out he'll have no trouble making it happen. I mean, you are one of the smartest kids in class. Well besides me anyway. She smiled at him. 
Midori awkwardly rubbed the back of his head at the compliment. Two don't K know about all that. Simon, you're smart as hell. Let me guess, you graduated top of your class in middle school, didn't you? She said with a playful nudge to the arm. Actually, no, I was homeschooled so I wouldn't know how well I stacked up against others. He absentmindedly responded in a joking tone before realizing what he just said. Takage sat up from her spot on the sofa and gave him a surprised look. Wow, I never would've guessed. Your teeth does make sense. You do seem like the homeschooled type. She teased. What's teeth that supposed to mean he quirked an eyebrow at her? Well, you're quiet, not very social and super nice. You totally have the homeschool kid vibe. Oh, a few seconds of silence passed between the two before Takage decided to make herself comfortable. And by comfortable, the girl scooted even closer Midoriya and leaned on his shoulder. Naturally, this caused the boy's face to erupt into an entirely new shade of red at this sudden contact and all the moisture seemed to escape his mouth. T.T. Takage-san, you don't mind do you and pretty beat and you're really comfortable to lay on. She batted her eyelashes at him. Midoriya sputtered for a moment before letting out a defeated sigh and accepting his fate. By this point he really should be used to girls' attempts to get a reaction out of him. So instead of fighting he just rolled with it. It's fine. Awesome she smirked only moments before a devious idea popped into her head. Hey, can I ask you another question? Sure. Do you think him cute? So much confusion hit Midoriya at the time that it made his head spin. The question resonated inside his mind over and over, shutting down his brain for a couple of seconds. Those were words he never expected to hear, much less coming from Takage. What he squeaked out loud enough to hear over at the reception desk. It's a pretty simple question, dude. Do you think him cute? I think that you're cute, so I wanted to know what you think. It was in that moment that Midoriya had to strongly consider whether or not he was actually transported to some alternate reality where he was just put into every uncomfortable situation possible. Did she really just ask him that out loud he already knew that Takage was bold, but this was an entirely different level. How could she possibly expect him to answer something like that? The boy took a second to rewire his brain as the girl waited for a response. But to make matters even more ridiculous, Takage decided to sit up and put her face right in front of his. Two sets of green eyes met each other and the temperature in the room seemed to elevate with each passing second. The girl was giving him an almost predatory-like smile and Midoriya quickly found himself folding under the pressure. Guys, he whispered out while forcing his eyes shut. Good to know. She kept up her toothy smirk while rubbing her hand through his hair. I'm glad to see that you have good taste. Oh my god you two are so adorable I. Flowery voice squealed out. The two teenagers turned their heads to the where none other than Ozhana gawking at them with heart in her eyes. Oh 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 Hanasan. Oh I'm sorry guys, I just got back and noticed you two sitting here. I didn't know that I was interrupting a moment. You weren't. It's all good. I just wanted to tease Mopped up a bit before we left. Awa, oh, uh, you even have cute pet names for each other you guys need to stop before you give me diabetes. If there was ever a time that Midwaria wished for a quirk that allowed him to turn invisible, now was definitely it. Not only had Takage succeeded in getting him flustered on a level that he never thought possible, yet another person was now under the impression that the two were dating. Coincidentally, this was also when the boy realized that overly forward women could be added to the list of his many weaknesses. Eventually, things calmed down to a more reasonable level ridiculousness when Takage and Edshot finally took their leave to head back to the man's agency. After saying their goodbyes, Katsuragi told the boy to rest up and get ready for his training to tomorrow morning. Apparently, they were going to pick up where they left off and continue to work on his fine-tuning his control, which reminded the boy of a conversation that he needed to have with one of his classmates. Rabbit, excuse me Yanagisen, are you busy? Ghost, no. Ghost, is there something that you need? Rabbit, no. Rabbit, but I learned something today that I think you'd be interested in. Ghost, is that so? Rabbit, yeah, I don't really have much use for it, but I think it could help you out a lot. Ghost, I'm all ears. After his brief chat with Yanagi, Midoriya showered and got ready for bed. While he scrolled through his news feed on his phone, an alert from the JNN popped up on the television at the front of the room. Curiosity got the better of him and he took a moment to read through the bulletin on the screen. Breaking news, wide-scale villain in attack in downtown Hasu. Residents are advised to stay indoors and avoid highly populated areas if possible. Heroes and police are currently on the scene and have the situation under control. Eyewitness testimony reports that the Endeavor Hero Agency is among their ranks. Him, I wonder what's going on over there Midoriya thought to himself before turning the television off and setting his phone down on the nearby nightstand. The boy made a mental note to remember to follow up on the situation in the morning. In latest news, the hero killer strikes again last night in the midst of the attack in downtown Hasu that was believed to have been orchestrated by the League of Villains. Yet another two lives were taken by the hands of the hero killer Stain. Among the deceased were the pro-hero native, and one other individual whose identity has not yet been made public. This attack is coming only a week after the pro-hero Ingenium suffered serious, life-threatening injuries at the hands of this masked murderer, along with several other heroes who were also found dead at the scene. Not much is known about the man or his quirk, or even his motivations for committing such heinous acts of violence. But residents of Hasu and the surrounding area are advised to remain vigilant. Any and all information pertaining to Stain's whereabouts should be reported to the local police as soon as possible.
The voice of the reporter echoed throughout the lobby. This hero killer seems to be quite dangerous, Katsuragi said as her and Midoriya made their way through the building. Yeah, the boy nodded nervously. From what I hear, Ingenium's hero career is over. That madman did quite a number on him. His younger brother is one of your classmates, right? Yeah, I don't really know the guy. The only time I talked to him was after our match in sport festival. Well, I hope he's doing all right. Did you know Ingenium? Fubicus and Midoriya asked. I ran into him a couple of years back when I was working a job near Tokyo. He was a very nice man and a top-notch hero if you ask me. He'll admit that watching how Team Idaton handled their business was the inspiration for how I restructured the agency. Wow, was all the boy said. Just as they were about to head out the door, Midoriya's phone went off. The boy pulled the device out of his tracksuit pocket to see that it was group chat for his class. Class 1B group chat. Fist hey guys. Kansensei wanted me to tell you guys before the official word was put out. But the school is cutting our internship short. Today will be the last day. Your pro should be receiving a notification from the school by this afternoon. Knife what? Beyblade what? Ball what why? Boxing glove do you know why? Cross might this have something to do with the attack in Hasu last night? Skeleton isn't Tetsu Tetsu kun over there dude are you alright? Dumbbell yeah, I was already in bed when that all kicked off. I slept through it. T-Rex yeah, that sounds about right. Good job metalhead. Mushroom and glad that you're alright. Lion this is quite unfortunate. Black and lame. Chameleon agreed. T-Rex Monoma, is your icon really a chameleon talk about unimaginative? Mushroom it makes sense though. Chameleon I think it's rather appropriate. However, let's not forget that a waste gun's icon is a welding torch. Welding torch hey I don't have anything to do with this shit. Cross language. Comic book there are way too many people in this chat. Ghost agreed. Fist back to the matter at hand. Fist can't and say didn't tell me the reason. But all of us need to be home by tomorrow morning. And Monday we need to make sure that we're all in class. Dumbbell this blows. T-Rex this still sucks though. I wonder why the sudden change. Knife someone probably did something stupid and all of us are about to get chewed out. Chameleon I bet it was one of those 1A jerks. Ball or Kamakiri finally went off the deep end and slashed someone in half. Knife you wanna fight me or something Subiraba. Cross if you're going to argue, please do it in a separate chat. T-Rex my money's on Kamakiri. Skeleton same. Black yeah that sounds about right. Ball dude. Beyblade sorry dude. But you get dusted. Beyblade or diced. Ball really feeling the love guys. Mushroom this way too entertaining. Welding torch this is way too much excitement this early in the morning. Do you motherers even know what sleep is? Skeleton says the guy who always passes out in the middle of ectoplasm and says lessons. Welding torch it's not my fault that math is boring as all hell. Apple I agree. Boxing glove okay, I think it's about time we end this. Lion yes, all of the necessary information has been relayed throughout the class. I'm sure that Kendowson will keep us out of the situation if any further updates come to light. Ball ha you said a. T-Rex lol. Cross grow up. T-Rex don't be such a stick in the mud I borrow. Comic book goodbye everyone. Knife deuces. Apple have fun with your internships, companions. Fist and stay out of trouble let's not throw more fuel onto the fire. Welding torch man, you really are the big sister of the class. Chameleon have a wonderful day. Rabbit I hope everyone has a good day. Beyblade holy shit Midori is alive after all. Now all we need is Kodai and Bondo and we'll have a full set. Lol. Cross language. Cross I hope that everyone has a blessed day. T-Rex you guys are great. Seeing as this was the final day of his internship, Midoriya was making it a point to absorb as much information as possible from Katsuragi. He had already learned a lot more than he expected from the heroine and he was grateful for her taking him on. But a part of him was sad that their time together was going to be cut short so soon. Wealth eyes is unfortunate. The woman sighed as she stretched out on the ground in front of her student. Cutting your internship short pretty much throws a monkey wrench into what I had planned for the week. Yeah, I wonder why the school decided to do it though. Who knows maybe something happened with that business in Hasu. I can't say for sure. Well in any case, we have to make the most of the remaining time that we have together. I was planning on working on your mobility and control some more. But we'll have to skip that for now. So what are we going to do? I wanted to talk to you about your match during the sports festival. More specifically, that move you used on that Bakugou boy. Omidoria's face shifted into an uncomfortable frown. Something like this was going to happen sooner or later. And no doubt the woman had a lot to say about it. To be frank, what you did could very well have ended that boy's life. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. A force choke as we call it is very high level move. It takes a ridiculous amount of concentration and control to perform, let alone safely. The fact that you can do it was a pretty good indicator that you haven't even come close to reaching your full potential. To my knowledge, only myself and my sister have been able to do it. Seriously Midoriya questioned. Yes, the woman nodded. When it comes to stuff like that, you're not using your quirk the same way as you would normally. Think of it in the same way as when you're trying to lift multiple objects at once. What you're essentially doing is creating a force field around a person's body and applying it to a specific area. The boy tapped a finger to his chin as he thought about the explanation. That makes a lot of sense. Everything we've done so far, including that, are pretty much the building blocks for one of my super moves, Hellstorm. I was hoping to improve your skills a bit more before I showed you how to do it. 
but I don't think we'll get the chance. I don't think I've ever heard of it. He told her. Observe. Midoriya watched as Katsuragi began floating in the air and placed herself a fair bit of distance away from him. Over the next few seconds, the woman lifted up a large sum of scrap metal in the nearby area and proceeded to use her quirk to create what he can only describe as a violent whirlwind of debris. It was certainly impressive by appearances alone, but even from where he was standing, the boy could see the woman straining a bit to keep it maintained. After about 30 seconds of this, she released her quirk and made her way back over to him. That was amazing. Yes, it is. So essentially, you used the debris that you manipulated and created some type of barrier zone that allows you to move them as fast as you want. By applying the concept of the force field you don't have to worry about hurting your allies while keeping a villain contained. That's exactly correct. Katsuragi smiled. It impressed her how smart the boy was. This was his first time seeing it action and he was already able to piece together the basics of how it worked. I need to make sure that I do whatever I can to get this boy to join the agency once he graduates. My sister created this move a while ago. She could do it on a much larger scale than I could, but even she had trouble with this when she first thought it up. Wow, Tornado was really something else, wasn't she? There's a reason why she made it to the rank of number four hero in the country. And it certainly wasn't her charming personality. Midoriya paused for a second as he processed that statement. Unlike most top heroes nowadays, Tornado certainly wasn't the most pleasant person in the world. Much like her sister, the woman rarely ever made any public appearances outside of her hero work and even skipped out on the national ranking ceremony a few times. In fact, the only interview of hers that he can remember was the one where she called Endeavor a muscle-bound flame brain who's too much of even go outside when it rained. Excuse me, Fubikissen, do you mind if I ask you a question? Go ahead. What was Tornado like? A brief beat of silence passed as the woman gazed up into the sky. In her mind, memories of her older sister flashed before eyes. Most of them were pleasant, while some were not. If I were to be completely honest was brash, moody, head-headed and impatient. She was disrespectful toward most people, especially to those she deemed incompetent. Growing up, she made it a point to never associate herself with people she thought were lazy or couldn't cut. The woman started while a not-so-pleasant memory crept into her mind. Damn it, a young Fubuki slammed her fist into the dirt after her failure to land even a single blow on the short, green-haired woman floating in the air in front of her. Come on, Fubuki, I'm hardly even trying. We've been going at this for two hours and you still haven't managed to touch me. I'm trying, okay, you're just too strong. Those sound like the words of a quitter. How do you expect to get into UA? If you can't even deal with something like this we have the same quirk, so this should be something you can handle. Well I'm sorry we can't all be freaks of nature you are you're a pro and I'm still in middle school for s sake. Tatsumaki's face shifted into an expression of absolute annoyance. You know if you were anyone else, I would've buried you under all this junk for speaking to me like that. I I I am sorry. The young girl quickly apologized. Maybe if you spent more time training instead of goofing off with those stupid friends of yours you wouldn't be having such a hard time. At least I have friends. A girl mumbled under her breath. What was that? And nothing. I thought so. Tatsumaki folded her arms in satisfaction. Mom and Dad let you move in with me so that I can supervise your training. And I plan to make sure that you take full advantage of it. So get the up and come at me again and this time, I don't want to see you riding around on one of those car doors. The only way to improve your flying is by doing it. Stop trying to weasel your way out of putting in the work. Okay. She told her while standing on two shaky legs before launching herself into the air. But above all else she loved being a hero and thought it was her duty to protect people. In her opinion, those with power should do whatever they can to keep others safe. She may not have been the most charismatic person in the world, but there was no denying that she could get the job done. The woman smiled. She sounds like a really interesting person. Just be glad you don't have to deal with having her as a mentor instead of me. I can't even tell you how many all-nighters she put me through when I was your age. She may have been stronger, but I'd like to think that I'm a far superior teacher. The woman laughed. Well, I think that you've done a wonderful job so far, Fubikissen. It's only been three days and you've already taught me so much. I'm honestly sad that we have to cut the internship short. I feel like I'm finally getting a handle on using my quirk in all types of ways. Midoriya said with an honest smile. And you still have a lot of room to grow. I was being serious the other day when I said that you could be on Wanachin's level one day. And you'll probably have a way better public image once you go pro. Assuming you don't let the fame go to your head. I wouldn't dream of it. I'm not in this for the popularity or anything like that. I just want to do what's right and save lives. I kinda want to be like you when I go pro. Just remember that I got first dibs on you after you graduate. After a few quick laughs, the green-haired duo wasted no time getting into their training for the morning. The first order of business was moving large objects while mid-flight. Midoriya was feeling pretty motivated before, but now he had even more reason to give it his all. He still had a long way to go before he could be the kind of hero he wanted to. But at least he finally had someone who he could look up to again. Once their morning training session was over, the two telekinetics were waiting to be picked up. Unlike the previous two days, Katsuragi wanted to conserve their energy for their last patrol together. The two didn't have to wait long before Ozhana pulled up to the junkyard in black sedan. 
This was his first time seeing the black-haired woman outside of her hero uniform and Midoriya was now feeling pretty self-conscious about his lack of muscle definition compared to the flame control user. You guys look like you're having fun the woman smiled while she gave the two greenettes a wave. Thank you for doing this Osanachin. I appreciate it. Katsuragi said. Don't worry about it boss, I was heading over to the agency anyway. Oh yeah Midoriya spoke up. Fubikusen did say that you were new to the agency, right? Sure am I transferred over a few months ago. And it's way better than the last place I worked at. Where was that if you don't mind me asking? I was at the Endeavor Agency before coming here. Really the boy's eyes blew open after hearing that. Even he knew how hard it was for a hero to get a job there. From what he's heard, the number two hero was extremely picky about who he allowed to work under him. Heroes from around the country would practically line up around the corner whenever a new spot opened up. This was his first time ever hearing about someone leaving such a well-respected agency. Would you come over here then? Mainly because it's close to where I grew up. Ozhana responded. But it's also because I prefer doing rescue work. I became a hero to save lives, not focus all my time on fighting villains and being Endeavor's personal cleanup crew. Plus I get the chance to work with the local fire departments. And working under him is not all that it's cracked up to be. Wow, Ozanachin is definitely someone you shouldn't take lightly. She might be the only person I've heard of that the number two hero recruited right out of high school. He only wanted me because I'm the only person that can snuff out his flames anytime I feel like it. Being there is cool and all, but he's terrible to work with. I can believe it. The boy said as his mind flashed back to his runin with the flame hero during the sports festival. If that quick interaction was any kind of indication, then actually working for the man must have been a nightmare. So what made you want to go into rescue work? I always wanted to be a hero like most people. But I was saved from a burning building by a firefighter when I was a kid. My quirk hadn't even come in yet and I was about to die before she got me to safety. Ever since then, that's what I decided that I wanted to do. And having a hero license meant that I could use my quirk to save more lives than being a regular firefighter. The black-haired woman smiled. I can understand that. With that, the group of three quickly hopped into the car to head back to the agency. Unfortunately for them, they ended up hitting a traffic jam along the way. And Katsuragi had no trouble making it known just how much she hated traffic jams. It was easy to forget that there was no job too small when it came to being a hero. When you're used to seeing wide-scale and overly dramatic fights on television all the time, you almost always miss the little things that heroes did to help out the common people. This was the lesson that Takage learned as she carefully guided a young brunette boy out of a tall tree after he got stuck on one of its branches. There you go little guy. The lizard tail splitter user smiled as she patted the youngling on the head and ruffled his hair. Thank you. The boy smiled back despite being embarrassed about this entire situation. Now remember, Headshot interjected. I know climbing trees and fun and all. But in the future, try to make sure that you have a way down before doing something so dangerous. I will Mr. Edshot, sir. Now run along and join the rest of you friends. Okay, have a good day. Heroes the boy bowed to them before running in the direction of a group of kids who were patiently waiting by a nearby bench. Good job, Lizardy. Blizzard told the girl with an approving grin. Thanks. The group of heroes and interns were making their way through a semi-crowded area when they spotted the boy across the street. Midoriya had offered to handle the situation, but Takage insisted on being the one to take care of it. So he let her have this small victory. Seeing as this was their last time patrolling together as a group, Blizzard and Edshot chose a more relaxed route compared to their previous two outings. However, it just so happened that this particular one led them right into the middle of a street performance of a local pop group. There was a pretty sizable crowd from what they could tell, meaning that they must have had a lot of fans. Overall it seemed like a rather peaceful day. That was until a loud scream from the other side of the crowd caught everyone's attention. Holy shit he's got a bomb a male voice shriek in absolute terror. The four of them turned their heads to see a wave of people suddenly running away from a plain-looking man with black hair and a white trench coat standing next to the stage. You people will finally know the pain I've felt for all these years take it in folks. This is what true power is the man shouted in manic glee as he tore off his coat to reveal a vest that was absolutely littered with what looked like packs of dynamite attached to it. Is that? Time seemed to stand still as the man lifted up his right hand into the air and showed what could only be the detonator for the device attached to his body. Just when the man was about to press the button, his body suddenly froze and he was unable to move. Everybody get the hell out of here Blizzard shouted at the top of her lungs as she held the man in place. She didn't dare take his eyes off of him otherwise she'd risk breaking her focus. And that was the last thing she was going to do in a situation like this. Blizzard, that means you too. Get as far away from here as you can Edshot cut Midoriya off as he glared at the two students. Part of the boy wanted to protest, but the more rational side of his mind didn't even hesitate to turn around and grab Takage before flying away. Once two of them and the rest of the crowd were at a reasonable enough distance, the students kept their eyes locked onto the confrontation. Let go of me you quirky bastard the man shouted towards Blizzard. What did he just call her Midoriya and Takage wondered simultaneously. Not on your life you maniac. People like you are always getting in my way you damn heroes and your flashy quirks think you are so damn noble don't you release me you. This guy's out of his mind. Blizzard thought before turning her attention over to the masked hero on her left. Headshot. Hold him still. 
I don't want to risk setting that thing off, was all the hero said while activating his quirk and launching himself towards the man. In the blink of an eye, Redwire danced through the air before piercing the criminal's mouth and knocking him out cold. Once that was done, Blizzard decided not to take any chances and levitated him further into the air away from the crowd. Skywalker, Lizardly hurry up and call the police. Tell them to get a bomb squad over here. I'm going to keep this guy in the air until they show up she ordered the two students. On it the green-haired boy answered back as he reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. While Midoriya was making the call, Takage was steadily trying to get her heart rate back under control. The girl all but froze the second she realized what was about to happen. Sure, they were pretty far away from where the guy was standing. But if Blizzard hadn't reacted as fast as she did, she didn't even want to think about what might have happened. The girl may have a regeneration ability, but she was not looking to test the limits of that anytime soon. In less than 10 minutes, police, first responders, and a few local heroes were on the scene and made quick work of disarming the man before securing him the back of unarmored vehicle and transporting him to the nearest precinct. Fortunately, no one was injured in all the confusion and they were able to safely dispose of the vest without it going off. While Blizzard was busy speaking to the police lieutenant, Headshot took the time to check on the two students. Are you guys alright? he asked in a concerned tone. We're fine. Takage answered him. I'm starting to think that cutting your internship short is a good idea. You kids really shouldn't be exposed to this kind of thing. Luckily Blizzard was here or else that would've gotten ugly. No kidding. Midoriya let out a shaky breath. The adrenaline in his body was finally wearing off and he was trying really hard to not think about how close everyone came to getting blown to bits. He may have had to deal with Bakugu growing up, but that was way too stressful even for him. Do you think that guy has something to do with all of the bombings that have been going on across the country over the last few days? One of our classmates said that something similar happened close to where he was interning at. The girl asked, I can't say for sure, but it certainly looks that way. The number 5 hero folded his arms. This is the second one in the prefecture. I read that there was another one this morning in Shimane. That's nuts. I'm also concerned about what that guy said before I knocked him out. The hero continued. That was another thing that stuck out to the two students. The man called Blizzard a quirky bastard before being put down. Neither of them had ever something like that before. And all they could do was assume that it was related to the reason why he decided to strap a bomb to his chest. A few minutes passed before Blizzard rejoined the group as the police took over the scene. News crews were starting to file in and the woman wasn't really in the mood to deal with that right now. I think we should head back to our agencies and let these two get ready to go. She stated. I agree. Headshot nodded. Did you learn anything? Midoriya asked the woman. Nothing significant for right now. The lieutenant said that he's going to be handling the case and asked me if I could provide some help. Seeing as this might be connected to all of the attacks that have been going on, he wants to be as thorough as possible. He'll be joining you. Something like this is too big of an issue not to get involved and I want to provide my services where I can. The masked man added on. He'll send you his contact information later. For now we should go. That was the last thing said before the group split up and made the journey back to their respective agencies. Before they left, Takage let the Midoriya know that she would text him as soon as she was released. All the boy did was nod at this as he and Blizzard took off into the sky. For some reason, Midoriya had a strange feeling in his gut about this entire situation. While well, Midoriya can, him sad that you couldn't get the full experience of what being a hero is like. But I hope that you take what you've learned here these past few days and use that information well. Katsuragi looked to her student from across her desk. This would be their last conversation together before Midoriya made his way back home. I will. Thank you for everything, Fubikusen. The boy bowed to the woman. Don't thank me, just make sure that you do well in class. I hope that y'all consider coming here again when you finally get the chance to do your work studies. But you shouldn't really have to worry about that until next year. So boss, are you ever going to give him his presents? Ozhana asked in an impatient tone. Ah, oh, the boy looked up in confusion. Without saying a word, Katsuragi activated her quirk and levitated two medium-sized white boxes over from the nearby table. Receiving any type of gift was the last thing Midoriya was expecting from his mentor. And judging by how nice those boxes looked, whatever was inside certainly wasn't cheap. I was going to give these to you on your last day, but now we won't get that chance. Don't take this the wrong way Midoriya-kun, but your hero costume is pretty dull. I thought it would be a good idea to add some flair to your look. That and this gave her an excuse to go on a late night shopping spree with Lilichin to buy some new shoes. Said Ozhana with a smirk on her face. Anyway Katsuragi coughed into her hand before opening both of the boxes. The woman proceeded to pull out two brand new jackets that looked way less opulent than the boy expected. They were rather simple in their design, both of them having large hoods and being long enough to stop at the midpoint of his thighs. One was black with green accents along the sleeves while the other had an inverted color palette. Pretty cool, how Ozhana smiled at him. Yeah. He nodded. We couldn't decide on which one to pick till we just ended up getting both. Both of these can be worn during warm or cold weather. They are very breathable and shouldn't limit your mobility. But don't think these are just a fashion statement. Both jackets are made of a material that's fireproof, water-repellent, and cut-resistant. It's actually the same stuff I use in my hero costume. 
I don't know what to say. Midoriya blushed while looking over the jackets. Well, you can try one on for starters. The woman shot back. Midoriya took her up on the offer and quickly grabbed the green-colored jacket before throwing it over his shoulders. Almost immediately he loved the way that it felt over his body and was pleasantly surprised by how easy it was to move in. He could definitely see himself adding on of these to his hero costume. Man, now that you have that thing on you two really do look like brother and sister. Hosanna laughed, earning an amused smile from her boss. Thank you very much for this, Fubicus and the boy bowed once again. It was my pleasure Midori-kun. Well, I better be on my way now. Again, thank you for everything. Are you sure you don't want us to give you a ride it's really not a big deal? No it's fine. You guys are busy and I don't want to be a burden. Well enjoy your journey back home and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. If you ever have any questions feel free to contact me. Yes mom, was the last thing he said before making his way out of the building. T-Rex hey what time is Blizzard letting you go? Rabbit she already did. T-Rex awesome headshot cut me loose a few minutes ago. Rabbit that's cool. T-Rex so what do you have planned for the rest of the day? Rabbit nothing really. I was just going to head back home and study. T-Rex do to seriously. Rabbit yeah. T-Rex we should totally hang out. T-Rex we can chill over at my place. The thought of going over to a classmate's house on a Friday night certainly wasn't the worst idea in the world. But when you take into account that said classmate was a girl, and one who made it her personal mission to tease him whenever possible, Midoriya couldn't quite bring himself to take the green-haired girl up on her offer. Rabbit am not really comfortable with that. T-Rex oh, alright then. Maybe some other time. Rabbit didn't you say that you usually have your family dinners on Fridays? T-Rex yeah, but my dad is working late tonight and Aunt Nimiri has something to do at the school. So it'll just be me. Rabbit oh. Rabbit well I don't have to be back home for a while. Maybe we can do something else. T-Rex wow mop top. Are you really asking me out on a date how bold of you? T-Rex. Rabbit nods out f. Rabbit no that's not what I meant at all. T-Rex whatever you say. T-Rex we can meet up at the train station and figure out what we want to do from there. Is that okay with you? Rabbit sure. T-Rex alright, then I hope you're ready for our second not date. After meeting up at the train station and making their way over to the shopping center next to her house, Takage and Midoriya decided to spend their brief outing at a ramen shop. Unlike their previous few times hanging out, the green-haired teen was marginally more talkative this time around. Of course, Takage was still the one leading the conversation. But she much preferred this to the usual one-word answers and short replies. It still sucks that we had to cut the internship short. Takage complained after taking a slurp of her noodles. Yeah. The boy nodded in agreement. Did you ask Midnight Sensei why the sudden change? I did, but she was tight-lipped about the whole thing. All she told me was that all of the Hero Course first years are going to be having some type of assembly when we get back to school on Monday. I hope nothing serious happened, Midoriya said with a worried tone. Awa, you look so adorable when you make that face. Have you ever considered working a part-time job as a teddy bear the girl teased while pinching his cheek? T. Takage and Midoriya squeaked out. The boy's eyes quickly glanced over to he one of the workers behind the counter who was smiling at them and giving him a thumbs up. Sorry, you're just too cute. This is so do you act like this all this time? No, but your reactions are just too fun not to mess with you she smirked. Hoping to gain some type of control on this situation, the boy quickly decided to change subjects. So what kind of training did you do with Edshot I never really got the chance to ask. Most of it was stealth training and helping me come up with a few new moves. He's a pretty awesome teacher. He even gave me a couple of books on reconnaissance and sneaking techniques as a goodbye present. What about you? Fubicusin actually showed me a lot of ways on how I can maximize my quirk. I'm actually looking forward to testing them out during class. You're lucky that you got to intern with someone who has the same quirk as you. I don't think that he'll ever get a chance like that since mine is so unique. The only people I have are my dad and my sister. Curiosity got the better of Midoriya in that moment and he couldn't help himself from inquiring about what sort of quirks the girl's family possess. Takage's ability was so unique that he had a hard time coming up with a combination that could produce such a versatile power. Do you mind if I ask what kind of quirks they have him assuming that they are very similar to yours? It's no problem at all. She smiled before slurping up some more noodles. My dad and my sister both have the same quirk, they call it dismemberment. The both of them can detach their limbs and control them remotely like I can. My mom had a regeneration ability but it wasn't very powerful. It's where I get the other part of my quirk from. Had Midoriya asked in a curious tone. She died on the job when I was little. The girl answered with a straight face and neutral tone. I'm sorry to hear that Midoriya replied in a soft, almost apologetic voice. It is what it is. Takage shrugged nonchalantly. How did him ask sorry? I probably shouldn't ask you something like that. It's cool. She waved off. She was a firefighter. From what my dad told me, she died saving someone on the job. Apparently she got injured during the rescue and her quirk couldn't repair the damage. Wow, yeah. What kind of work does your dad do you said he works a lot so it must be pretty important. He's an engineer at a hero support company. He's actually the one that makes all of Aunt Nemira's hero suits, it's how the two of them met. All of them Midoriya's mind flashed back to now infamous video of his teacher's hero debut in her less than appropriate outfit. That one event was what caused the change in how much skin a hero could expose in their costume. 
even nowadays, heroes needed to have written justification on any extreme elements to their attire. Yes, even her first one. Takage giggled. It's kind of funny, that whole thing made my dad kind of famous in the support industry. And Aunt Nimiri is still pretty pissed about it. But if you think that was bad, you should see what her costume was when she was still at UA. Now that one was juicy. He'll take just take your word for it. What about you? I've never heard you talk about your parents before. What do they do? Omi mom's a legal assistant and my dad works as a welder in the US, he told her. That's pretty cool. What kind of quirks do they have? They gotta be pretty good to make one as powerful as yours. Midoriya let out a quick chuckle to hide the slight bit of pain he felt in his heart after hearing that. Nothing special really. My dad can breathe fire and my mom has a telekinetic quirk kind of like I do. Except she can only pull small objects towards her. Weird. With that combination you think Yao'd get some type of fire manipulation quirk or something like that ember lady who works for Blizzard has. Yeah that would make a lot of sense. He awkwardly agreed. Eventually, the two teenagers finished up with their meal and began making their way back over to the train station. Takage insisted on walking her classmate all the way there, despite it being a bit out of her way. Midoriya didn't really have the heart to tell her no, so he just let her do as she pleased. Thanks for hanging out with me, mopped up. I really appreciate it. She smiled at him with her hands at her back as the two walked side by side. It was no problem at all, takage -sen. Once the two were right in front of the terminal, Takage suddenly planted herself right in front of Midoriya. The boy's face instantly heated up at her close proximity and the girl seemed determined not to break eye contact with him. I'm going to hug now, she told him with a toothy grin. WW what he blurted out faster than his brain could stop him. I'm going to hug you. I was going to do it regardless, but I thought I should at least give you a little warning. WY. Because I want to. That's not. Midoriya was cut off when the girl plunged herself into his chest and wrapped her arms around his body. Naturally, he had no clue what to do in the situation. Over the next few seconds the boy stood as still as a statue, while his entire head turned an even more furious shade of red. With each passing moment his brain turned to mush and his heart was ready to leap out of his chest. Was this something that friends usually do when saying goodbye to each other he had no clue. He knew that girls were typically more expressive and affectionate with their friends than guys. Maybe that was just a normal thing for her. Psst, mopped up. You're supposed to hug me back. Takage whispered with a playful grin. She was obviously enjoying this for multiple different reasons. Uwake. He nodded as he robotically wrapped his arms around her. Another few seconds of this and he was worried that he would spontaneously burst into flames. Eventually the green-haired girl broke the friendly embrace and ruffled his hair with her hand. We'll have to work on that. She laughed before turning on her heels and making the journey back home. See you on Monday mopped up try not to dream about me too much. Why he whispered as he watched the girl disappear down the road. Once he got himself in order, Midoriya quickly boarded his train back home and plopped onto the open seat next to the door. A hug from earlier was still fresh in his mind as he was absolutely certain that his face was going to remain flushed for the rest of the night. As he looked back down at his metal briefcase containing his hero costume, the boy suddenly remembered that he had at least thing that he needed to handle over the weekend. Midoriya ran a hand through his wild green mane and started scrolling through his phone while looking up barber shops in the area. I wonder what kind of style I should get. He thought to himself before leaning back in his seat and letting out a heavy sigh. He'll admit that even I have a difficult time controlling this one. But it should serve you quite well. What is? Don't worry my boy, you will feel no pain. Go on and achieve your dream. And Yao'd do well to know that if you ever chose to return to me, I am here for you. Ah Midoriya shouted, launching himself up from his bed. The boy's eyes darted around the room, looking to see where he was. His breath was unsteady and his mouth was dry. It only took a few seconds for him to notice to excessive amount of sweat covering his entire body. What the hell was that he wondered out loud as he ran a hand through his hair. Midoriya didn't dream that often. Actually, the boy would say it was a rare occurrence altogether. But something about the hazy image in his head was odd. It felt real. If he didn't know any better, he would say it felt more like a distant memory rather than some random fabrication that his mind had concocted. Deciding not to dwell on it, the green-haired teen quickly got himself out of bed and made his way towards the bathroom to get ready for school. The early morning commute to UA was just as chaotic as it usually was. Midoriya was sitting in a train car that looked to be just about filled minus the seat next to him and a few others scattered throughout the area. Ever since making it into the most famous hero school in the country and his success in the sports festival, the boy had grown accustomed to random passersby recognizing either himself or the uniform he wore. Pretty much all of the comments that people gave him were positive, which he was thankful for. But a few people here and there couldn't help but mention how wild or awesome he looked choking out his classmate on national television. Luckily for him, everyone seemed to be too busy to say something to him on this particular morning, which he silently hoped would become a more frequent occurrence. Excuse me, may I sit here? A deep voice said to them once the automatic doors closed after picking up another set of passengers. Midoriya looked up only to be met with the sight of another student wearing the same uniform as he was. The person in question had a head similar to that of a crow and the boy immediately recognized him as one of the other hero course students from the sports festival. If his memory was correct, the guy had some sort of shadow spirit quirk. Uh, sure. Midoriya. Simply nodded. Thank you, Midoriya. 
The boy gave a polite bow before taking the open seat next to him. It's no problem, Takoyami. He answered his silent question. Right, it's no problem, Takoyamison. So I am to assume that your class had their internships brought to a halt as well the bird-headed teen inquired in rather peculiar manner of speech. Yeah, I see, Takoyami replied. You wouldn't happen to know the reason why this is do you none of my other classmates seem to know and I am rather curious. No clue. Everyone in 1B is pretty much in the dark. I see. The two sat in rather peaceful silence over the next couple of minutes. It was weird how this was his first real interaction with someone from the other class. Aside from a short talk with Ida after their match and that time after class with that Yuraka girl. You would think that by this point in the school year they would've had more time to get to know each other. But considering the mess their class went through, it was understandable. So hats it like in 1A if you don't mind me asking Midoriya said in a rather nervous tone. His curiosity getting the better of him. As normal as one would expect, I suppose. It's not much different than what I've seen in previous institutions. Though our homeroom teacher is quite eccentric. I am curious about your class as well. Pretty much the same really. You seem to have a lot of capable students in your class. I was able to rewatch some of the footage from the sports festival and you all performed admirably well. I admire how you work together to overcome the obstacle course. It was a sound strategy. Yeah, we kind of just freestyled everything to be honest. But your class were the ones who everyone was paying attention to. You have a point. You also have a lot of really strong guys. Midoriya continued. Not only did they have Bakugou in 1A, but they had the son of the number 2 hero, the brother of another popular hero. And if his assumptions were correct, the daughter of one of the biggest business conglomerates in the entire country. On paper, it seemed like 1A was where all the top candidates were placed in. The same could be said for your class, or you in particular. Huh. You left quite an impression on my classmates, myself included. You bested Todoroki and Ada in the competition. And you came close to defeating Bakugou as well. Objectively speaking, those are our three strongest members. Midoriya blushed a little and began scratching his cheek. It are really wasn't all that impressive. I pretty much got lucky in my match against Todorakasen and I had just had the advantage over Adesan when it came to quirks. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Go ahead. Bakugou seems to harbor a bit of a grudge against you. Ever since your match he's been marginally more irritable as of late. He's mentioned you quite a few times and doesn't exactly hold you in high regard. Might there be a history between you two? I can't exactly say that I wasn't expecting that. Midori aside internally. Of course Bakugou was still pissed at him. What else was new he made it a point to avoid the explosion quirk user whenever possible. But now it seems like hell have to be extra careful in the future. Something like that. Was all Midori felt like replying with. I see, forgive for prying into your business in such a way. The raven-headed teen apologized. It's no problem. That was the last thing said before the two teen ended their conversation. Midori and Takoyami sat in peaceful silence for the rest of the train ride. Admittedly, the boy found it somewhat refreshing that not everyone in 1A was like his former friend. There was no shortage of chatter and excitement in the classroom as the students of 1B patiently waited for the bell to ring. Naturally, the only thing everyone could talk about were their internships and how they went. For the most, everyone seemed to have a fun time with their pros and a few people were even talking about all the stuff they learned. That's still pretty crazy though. I don't know what I would've done if I was there. Kendu said after Takage finished telling their group about their last day with Katsuragi and Kamahara. At the moment, the Lizard Tail Splitter user's desk was surrounded by Kendu, Tetsu Tetsu, Shizaki, Kaibara, Honuki, and Tsunotori. Seriously, I'm thankful that you came out of that unharmed. The vine-haired girl added. Yeah, if Blizzard wasn't there, it would've been bad. Kaibara was the next to speak. Still, a ton of crazy stuff happened last week. Shota said that one of those attacks happened close to where he was interning. It's no wonder why the school pulled us out early. I wonder what the assembly is going to be about this morning. It's just all of the Hero Course first years, right Honuki asked. No clue, Aunt Nimiri wouldn't spill. Takage shrugged. The R-rated heroine was acting rather odd this morning. Normally her and Tetsu Tetsu would take the train over to school, but she insisted on driving the two of them there herself just to make sure that they made it on time. The conversation went on pretty normally for the next few minutes. That was until a way suddenly shouted loud enough to catch everyone's attention. Oh shit Midoriya, is that you? Every set of eyes currently in the classroom turned towards the door and a collective gasp escaped their mouths once they got a look at their classmate. It was Midoriya, standing there with a not so subtle amount of redness on his cheeks, looking very different from the last time they saw him. From the neck down, everything was the same, right down to his signature red boots. But that's not what everyone was focused on. The real story of the morning was his hair. The fluffy mop of green locks that they were all so used to seeing was gone. The sides and back of his head were shaved close to the scalp. And on the top, his hair was still thick and curly but cropped to about half of its original length. What? A slightly bewildered Takage thought as she visually inspected his person. At the front of the room, Midoriya was quickly regressing into a blushing mess at all of this unwanted attention. Literally every single one of his classmates was staring at him as they tried to process what they were seeing. And the boy was now regretting not wearing some type of hat over his head. H hey guys. He greeted them with a shaky wave. 
All of a sudden, the floodgates seemed to open and almost half of the students shot out of their seats and ran up to him. Dude, what the hell is this would you cut your hair Tetsu Tetsu was the first to speak. Oh man, what the hell happened to you Tsuburaba was the next to comment. You look so different Kamori smiled at him. I like it. Kendu gave an approving nod. Over the next few seconds, all Midoriya could do was give everyone an awkward laugh as he tried his best not to faint from being the center of attention. Right as the boy was about to speak, a set of hands placed themselves on either side of his face and his head was turned to the left. Two sets of green eyes locked onto each other and the boy's face reddened even further. Takage was definitely having a hard time trying to contain herself as she inspected the boy's features from top to bottom. She wasn't prepared for this at all. Not in the slightest. Why didn't he say anything about getting his hair cut this was way too monumental to just spring on her out of the blue like this. The girl subconsciously began running her fingers through what was left of his mane and she suddenly felt a bit of heat welling up in her face. Oh shit's kinda hot. The girl thought. Is she actually blushing Tetsu Tetsu looked at his longtime friend in disbelief. This may have actually been the first time in his life that had seen the girl flustered in any type of way. The sound of Shizaki coughing into her hand snapped the green-haired duo out of their awkwardly intimate moment and brought them back to reality. There were a few jokes and snide remarks at the girl's bravery to grope one of her classmates right before their very eyes. But it was nothing inappropriate. You're an asshole. The girl fake pouted as she folded her arms across her chest. Amitaria blinked. Now I have to come up with a new nickname for you. I can't call you mopped up anymore. She explained. Oh he gave her a nervous grin. Still man, you look pretty stylish. Honuki joked while patting him on the back. Yeah Midoriya, you look like a total boy Tsunotori smiled at him. Pony, the FFFT Takage couldn't stop herself from laughing after hearing that. Oh damn, Waste nearly double over as he failed to contain his own laughter. But the horn teen looked around in confusion. A few steps behind her, Monoma was cackling like a madman while supporting himself on Subiraba's shoulder. The blonde teen was doing his best to remain calm but he just couldn't do it after witnessing something so hilarious. Luckily Kendu was quick to scold him by chopping him in the back of the neck. That's not funny, Monomekan. What's wrong the American girl inquired again. Dude, do you know what you just said Takage asked in English. I told him that he looks really cool. That's definitely not it. Well what did I say? You called him a boy the girl announced while grabbing her sides and leaning over the nearby desk. Immediately, Tsunotora's face reddened and she began bowing to Midoriya in an attempt to apologize. I'm so sorry Midoriya, I didn't know I thought I was giving you a compliment. Monoma tricked me. I didn't mean it. Please forgive me she frantically said with a slight tear in her eye. It's okay, Tsunotorisan. Midoriya waved off in a slightly dejected tone. What's going on a stoic voice suddenly spoke up. Everyone's attention now turned to the perpetually emotionless face of Yanagi who just walked into the classroom. A pale blue eye lingered on Midoriya's form for a few seconds before the girl made the journey over to her seat. Nice haircut, Midoriya-kun. T thank you, Yanagisan. He replied. Oh yeah, were you able to do that thing I showed you? Sort of. I was going to ask you a few more questions later when you get the chance. Him having some trouble with it. Oh, Takage interjected in a teasing tone. What's going on here you showed Ghosty a new trick huh? The implication of what she was saying was not lost on either of the two telekinesis users at all. Midoriya was about to fumble his way through an explanation. But luckily for him, Yanagi was faster in her response. Midoriya-kun showed me a new way to apply my quirk. I think it will be a very useful skill to use. Nan I can't crack you at all, can I? Unlikely. Things settled down after the bell finally rang and Ken walked into the room. Their homeroom teacher looked like he had seen better days and some would say that his shoulders looked particularly heavy this morning. Alright students I know you all want to discuss your time in turning with your pros, but we're going to hold off on that. We need to hurry up and get over to the auditorium. I'm telling you now, if anyone says something that makes me angry attention will be the least of your worries. A few students gulped at this. Ken never made any type of threat, this might have actually been their first time hearing one coming from the man's mouth. Whatever was about to happen, it certainly wasn't good. In no time, all of the first year students of the hero course were gathered together in the school auditorium. There was a weird tension in the air as everyone eyed each other across the seats. This was the first official introduction the students were given to their sister classes since starting at UA and no one had any clue what the reason was for bringing them together. In his seat between Takage and Yanagi, Midoriya could feel a set of eyes boring a hole into the back of his head. If he were to turn around to get a look at what was causing this slight disturbance, he would have seen Bakugu grimacing at him a couple of rows away. Luckily, the boy chose not to do that. On the stage at the front of the auditorium sat almost all of their teachers including Snipe, Thirteen, and Hound Dog. All of them looked rather unsettled and it was pretty obvious that something major was going on. So what do you think they want to talk about? Subiraba whispered to the group while leaning forward in his seat. No clue. Kendu shrugged. I bet you 500 yen that all of us are in trouble. Kamakiri commented. It seems that way. Takage stated. Before the whispers and assumptions could get out of hand, Principal Nezu and All Might entered the room. The hulking hero walked with his usual strut, but Midoriya noticed that symbol of peace wasn't sporting his usual trademark smile. 
Whatever was going on, it had to be serious for him of all people to be wearing a frown on his face. Once they were on the stage, Nezu wasted no time walking up to the podium and addressing his students. Greeting everyone, it warms my heart to see that you all safely returned from your internships and are able to join us today. As much I would love to pretend that this assembly I've gathered you all for was a positive one, I can't quite bring myself to do that. The white-furred mammal said in a somber tone, I'd prefer not to mince words when speaking about this subject, so we'll just get right into it if you don't mind. A couple of you are already of this and we've managed to keep it a secret up until now. But it brings me great sorrow to announce to you that your classmate, Tenya Ida, died last Thursday. Silence fell over the room as the hero course hopefuls processed the man's announcement. Everyone began looking around at one another with a myriad of different expressions, but no one dared to say a single word. Some were confused, others were just plain shocked. And Shizaki immediately let out a silent prayer as she clasped her hands together. The Yeda family has chosen not to disclose this information to the general public for the time being, but have given us permission to tell you all. They are family is going through quite the troubling time as of right now, so this was no doubt hard for them to do. They ask that you keep this information to yourselves until the official announcement has been made. What the hell Takage said under her breath while sinking into her seat. Beside her, Midoriya was still in shock. Sure, he only ever met the guy one time and didn't know him at all. But this was still alarm news. It was already bad enough that one had to go through that whole business at the USJ, but this was just too much. If he didn't know any better, he'd say that their class was cursed. The boy turned around to where class 1A was sitting and they all look absolutely gobsmacked. Apparently, none of them knew about this either. Principal Nezu, sir. What happened Monoma raised his hand as he was the first person to work up the nerve to speak out loud. A heavy sigh escaped the principal's mouth before looking towards the blonde-haired student. Young Ada's life was brought to an end by the hands of the hero killer Stain. He and another individual were found dead at the scene after the attack on Hasu was brought to an end. Midoriya's mind began connecting dots that he wasn't sure even existed. Stain was responsible for this the unknown villain had already brutally maimed Ingenium not even two weeks ago. And now he was responsible for killing his younger brother from everything he had seen on the news about the man. There wasn't any real method or common denominator to whom he crossed paths with other than the fact that they were heroes. But now he was going over students a part of Midoriya had to wonder if the guy had some sort of grudge against the Ida family. Oh my god, Kendu drug her hand across her face. The sound of sniffling and coughing echoed from the back row of the group and Midoriya once again turned his gaze to see what was going on. In his line of sight he could see the brunette girl, Yuraka, looking as if she was on the verge of a breakdown. Tears were running down her face and he couldn't help but feel awful for her. At the very least, the dark-haired girl with the scar on her face who went by Tsu was consoling her. I understand that this is very alarming news for all of you. Nezu stated once again, I also want you all to know that our faculty is here for you if you need it. Inuakun will be providing counseling sessions to anyone that wants to speak with him after we conclude this assembly. And anyone who feels as though they need time off can request it through their homeroom teacher. That certainly made a lot of sense. Of course some of the students would need time to wrap their heads around and come to terms with this entire affair. They just lost a classmate to a deranged murder. In addition to this, the funeral for young Tenya Ida will be held this Saturday in Tokyo for those who wish to pay their respects. All of you have been invited and I would be grateful if you were to attend and give his family your regards. A long moment of silence followed that announcement. It didn't take long before the waterworks were in full effect and most of 1A were sobbing in their seats. The only people who didn't seem to be shedding any tears were Todoroki, Bakugu, Takoyami and the masked boy with six arms. All of them still looked pretty surprised by this, so maybe they were still reeling. Now students, he'll turn the floor over to Aizawakun. He has a few things that must be addressed. I know all of you still need time to come to terms with the passing of your classmate, but please do your best to listen to what he has to say. As Nezu stepped down from the podium, Aizawa made his way up. By this point, Midoriya was well aware that Eraserhead was the homeroom teacher for the other hero class. From what he knew, he was one of the teachers injured during the USJ attack along with 13. And judging by the fact that he was wearing an eye patch over his right eye, he went through his own fair share of hell during that time. Forgive me for having to change the mood so drastically. The black-haired man began. His voice was tired and raspy and he looked as if he hadn't gotten any sleep in days. But there are some details about this situation that you all need to be made aware of. Can you please elaborate, Sensei? From the information that we have along with several eyewitness testimonies, it has come to our attention that this incident could have been avoided. He stated, What do you mean? I'm going to give it to you straight. He had purposely went looking for a fight with Stain. The pro hero that he was interning under told us that as soon as the League of Villains attack started, your classmate ran off on his own and tried to hunt down the hero killer. What several students shouted in disbelief. As many of you know, his brother was injured by the man as well. With this in mind, along with the fact that he chose an internship in Hasu over anywhere else, it stands to reason that Ida went there with the full intention of confronting the hero killer himself. Stain is known to operate in secluded alleys away from the public and that's exactly where Ida's body was found. I'm not going to speculate what his exact reasons were. But the fact of the matter is, he went looking for a fight and he found it. That can't be true Yuraka suddenly shouted. 
The girl looked absolutely ragged. Edakon would never do something that reckless. Your rock is right, Ed is way too smart to go after someone like that on his own. Kirishima followed up. Honestly, it does make sense though. Takage thought to herself. The guy's brother was paralyzed by the man barely a couple of weeks ago and he had the perfect chance to settle the score. Revenge may not have been the hero way, but she could understand why the indigo-haired team might have done it. He had a damn good motive and the means to do something about it. In all fairness, she doesn't know what she would do if she was put in that situation. I understand how you feel, but take all of this into account. Several local heroes spotted him running through alleyways in the area and it was confirmed that he abandoned the pro hero that he was with the first chance he got. You can't be serious. I want all of you to understand that you are still students. Some of you may have gone through your fair share of ordeals, but you are a long way away from being licensed heroes. Acting foolishly and taking things into your own hands will almost always result in outcomes like these. You all need to understand that so something like this never happens again. Geez, he could stand to be a bit more compassionate. Ken leaned over and whispered to Kayama. The R-rated heroine let out a low sigh before responding. It's better that hear this now instead of later. I agree with you though. But ripping the band-aid off is probably the best way to do it for right now. Deciding that his students had enough of his bluntness, Aizawa backed away from the podium and retook his seat. The assembly ended shortly after that and the students made their way back to their class. As expected, a good portion of 1A stayed behind to talk to Inui and amongst themselves. A part of Midoriya felt compelled to try and console his classmates, but he decided against it since it wasn't really his place. However, as his group exited the assembly hall he noticed Todoroki glaring at him with a cold expression on his face. The rest of the morning went on rather quickly after the assembly. There was a metaphorical storm cloud looming over the hero course students' heads due to the information that they were given earlier that morning. But luckily their teachers decided to take it easy on them today. Once the bell rang, the students began filing out of the classroom to make the short trip over to the cafeteria. Are you going off on your own again today? Izuku Takage asked the boy while pulling out her dinosaur-themed bento box filled with a healthy serving of yakitori and steamed rice. A few curious heads darted over to the two of them after hearing the girl call the boy by his first name. And Midoriya lightly blushed. Wow, you two finally on a first name basis what a surprise. Tetsu Tetsu said in a joking tone. To um, you should totally eat with us today. The green-haired girl continued as if it was a normal day. That reminds me, where do you disappear off to during lunch? Midori, can I never see you in the cafeteria and you're always here before anyone else? Honuki inquired. By this point Kendu, Shizaki, Tsunotori and Awais were already huddled around them and Midori suddenly felt the need to jump out the window and fly away from all of this unwanted attention. He really didn't want to reveal his not so secret hiding spot to his classmates yet. Sure, he was slightly more comfortable talking to them than when the school year started. But the boy still felt as if he needed his afternoon break from all the social interaction. If Midori Kun doesn't want to eat lunch with the rest of the class then we shouldn't bother him about it. The stoic voice of Yanagi answered for the boy as the pale girl walked past the group. Oh Simon, ghosty. Takage whined. Aren't you the least bit curious about where he runs off to? Yes, I am. The poltergeist user responded without missing a beat. Seriously Tetsu Tetsu quirk an eyebrow at her. I'm also curious about where Midori Kun goes during lunch. But it's none of my business. Kendu was the next to speak up. The Anagichans write you guys. Anyways we should hurry and get to the cafeteria before the rest of the crowd shows up. Well see you after lunch, Midori Kun. Alright Takage deflated as she fell in step behind her class rep. See you in a bit, Izuku. Have a good lunch, Midori Kun. Yanagi flatly stated as the rest of the group walked out the door. Midori wasn't expecting his grey-haired classmate of all people to come to his rescue. But he was glad that the girl was able to get the heat off him. The boy made a mental note to tell her thank you for that before making his way out of the classroom and up towards the roof of the building. Midoriya let out a sigh of relief as he planted himself on the ground and opened his bento box. Despite the terrible mood of the first few hours of the day, the almost perfect weather seemed to make up for it. As the boy began digging into the generous serving of katsudan that his mom had prepared for him, he reached into his back pocket and retrieved a small metal rod no bigger than the size of a pencil. One of the training methods that he had learned from Katsuragi was to use this metal stick to practice his control in his downtime. And ever since returning home from his internship, he had been doing it practically non-stop. From what he had been told, reshaping things on a smaller scale would help him out when it came to bigger objects the more he practiced. He still couldn't mold the rod into a coil shape like Katsuragi could, but now he was able to create a crescent moon with little difficulty, and him still having trouble performing Hellstorm. The boy thought to himself as he took another bite of his lunch. Although he knew the steps that went into the super move, doing them was a whole different story. He had spent nearly all of Sarah trying to replicate what the woman had shown him, and he had succeeded to some extent. When it came to lifting up and rotating the pieces, that part was easy. But the real problem came when he increased the speed. For some reason, whenever he tried to make the cyclone of debris move faster it would just fall apart after about 10 seconds. Which wasn't nearly good enough. Maybe it has something to do with my visualization. Who would are trying to visualize a familiar voice asked. Out of instinct, Midoriya jumped back and launched himself into the air. 
Once the boy was able to reorient himself, he looked back to where he was previously sitting to see none other than Nejire Hadu casually floating towards him. Hado Senpai, that's my name, don't wear it out sorry for startling you, I was trying to get your attention but you had this really intense look on your face and you were talking to yourself. Do you do that often the Blanette asked while going in circles around him. It's a habit that I'm trying to break. Nidoriya blushed slightly. Oh yeah, this was still a thing. With all of the excitement going on the boy forgot that his favorite lunch spot had been compromised. He didn't have anything against the wave motion user, but he really wasn't in the mood to deal with a seemingly endless ball of energy at the moment. So what are you doing back in school so soon don't the first years have their internships this week the Blanette inquired. They got cut short, was Midoriya's response. Wow that sucks. Yeah. Ooh hey, I bet you learned a lot of cool stuff from Blizzard didn't you we should totally train together sometime. I think it would be a lot of fun. I don't know about all that, said Midoriya in a nervous tone. Something in the back of his head was telling him that he didn't want to run the risk of getting into a fight with this girl. She may have added herself into his hero notebook, but he had a sneaking suspicion that she left out a few major details when it came to her quirk. Come on, it will be fun third years get to reserve the training grounds when they are not being used for class, so we can have the entire place to ourselves. We can even bring your girlfriend along so she won't get jealous. A wave of emotions washed over Midoriya's body as his face heated up. All right, there was also this worry about. The last time they spoke, Takage put the idea in her head that the two were dating. This was already bad enough in and of itself. But the fact that the blue-haired girl definitely seemed like the type to gossip certainly wasn't helping. Yes, she's no. Hey, did you know that you look a lot like a tomato when you get all flustered? She's the boy was cut off when the girl's phone went off, alerting her that she had a text. Hadu held the device up to her face for a moment before her eyes widened in a cartoonish fashion. Sorry Kohai, I gotta run. Work study stuff. He'll see you around was the last thing the girl said before making a beeline for the door and disappearing into the building. Seeing as he once again missed his chance to set the record straight, all Midoriya could do was let out a defeated sigh and fly back over to his food. Although he was glad that he could once again eat his lunch in peace, he made a mental note to resolve this issue as soon as possible. Settle down, my young pupils, Cemento said to the class. All Might had an emergency and won't be able to make it. So your heroics class this afternoon will be treated as a free period so to speak. You can spend this time however you like. Also Midoriya and Yanagi, Kenkan informed me that you two need to head down to the support studio for possible updates to your costumes. Major Makan is there right now, so he should be able to assist you. Yes, Sensei. Both telekinesis users nodded before getting up and walking out of the room with their briefcases. Midoriya was curious about what the support department was like. So far as he knew, he had never interacted with any of the students in that class. Just like the hero course, the support course was regarded as one of the best in the country and for good reason. Many widely known inventors and engineers got their start there. So what did you need to go down to the support studio for Yanagi stoically asked. I got a gift from Fubikasen that I want to add to my costume. Apparently, I need to fill out a form and get it cleared by power loader. He replied, Midoriya was by no means the best conversationalist in the world. But even he had to admit that talking to the gray-haired girl was a bit weird. She never changed her tone of voice and her face remained neutral at all times. The only other person in their class who seemed more emotionally disconnected was Kodai. Oh, how about you? It actually has to do with the air surfing technique you told me about. Really? Yes, I tried doing it a few times but I keep running into an issue. Because I can't use my quirk on myself, I'm having trouble staying on top of whatever I use. The poltergeist user explained. That makes sense, Midoriya thought. Although their quirks were similar, fundamentally they worked in different ways. The fact that the girl couldn't manipulate her body along with whatever she chose to ride on meant that she would be at risk of falling every second she was in the air. When he tried doing the move himself, he didn't have too much trouble with it other than maneuvering. But Yanagi had an entire different hurdle she needed to work around. So you think that the support department will be able to make something for you? Possibly. The girl gave him a lazy semi-shrug. It didn't take long for the two students to finally reach their destination. The hallway that was designated for the first-year classes of the support course was a lot quieter than either one of them had imagined. In truth, they were expecting the place to be buzzing with activity. But that just wasn't the case. Deciding not to dwell on it any further, the two stopped at a large iron door labeled Support Studio and Midoriya wasted no time sliding it open. Ah, the boy shouted as a large wrench flew past his face. If he had been standing a few more centimeters to his left, he probably wouldn't be conscious right now. What the hell Midoriya turned around to see the thing lodged firmly in the wall behind him. Are you okay Yanagi inquired in her monotone voice. Yeah, whoops I guess I shouldn't have left that next lying around, a female voice said in a jovial tone. Damn it Hatsum an angry sounding power loader caught the duo's attention as they turned their gaze inside the room. There, the 1B students watched the man wave his fist at a girl with pink dreadlocks who was covered in a layer of what they assumed to be some type of oil. How many times do I have to tell you to stop leaving your tools all over the place someone could've gotten hurt? No harm no foul, sensei. At least now we know that I was able to increase the lateral speed on this robotic arm baby the girl smiled as she picked up what looked to be some type of tablet on a nearby table. 
That's not the point, Amitaria Nervous interjected. Is this a bad time? Both occupants of the room turned towards them. Amitaria and Yanagi, correct Ken told me that you two were going to be showing up. Majima greeted the two of them. Sorry about that. Hatsumir still hasn't fully grasped what the word safety means. It's okay. Yanagi answered. Please, come in. The helmet-wearing hero waved them on. You two were hoping to make some updates to your costumes, right? Yes, sir. Midoriya was the first to speak. I was told that I have to fill out a form to add a new piece of gear to my costume that I received from the hero I interned with. That's right. The school board is pretty lenient when it comes to adding personal items to your costumes, but you still need to file it with us first. The pro hero explained before turning to Yanagi. How about you? I'm looking to see if I can make a new addition to mine, Sensei. I've recently learned a new way to use my quirk but am having trouble applying it without the proper gear. I was hoping that you could help me. So what did you have in mind? Yanagi proceeded to go into a brief explanation on the concept of air surfing and what her difficulties were. While she was doing that, a certain pink-haired girl crept closer and closer to where the group was standing. I see Majima nodded. So not only do you need something to transport yourself on that's lightweight, you also need a way to keep yourself attached to it. Yes, I know exactly what you need. Hatsum suddenly appeared in front of them with a giant smile on her face. The solution is actually really simple. I can whip something up for you in no time. Wow, really Midoriya wondered. Majima let out an exasperated sigh as he pitched the bridge of his nose. Since she won't introduce herself properly, I guess he'll have to do it. This is Mei Hatsum. She's also a first year and I've assigned her to be the one that works on both of your costumes. It's the reason why she's here. Nice to meet you, the girl beamed. Both of ours Yanagi tilted her head. Yes, the support course only seats 10 in each class so our students double up on which hero course student they are assigned to. As luck would have it, both of you have been assigned to Hatsum here. Well, that's convenient. Oh, now I remember you. You're the one with the helmet I worked on. How do you like it? Hatsum eagerly asked while completely disregarding his personal space. Seriously, does every girl he runs into not know what boundaries are? E, it works f fine. The boy blushed while backing away. Without any warning, the pink-haired teen grabbed the two telekinesis users by the arms and dragged them into the room. We don't have a moment to waste. I can already tell that the three of us are going to be making a lot of babies together. What? Relief is the emotion that Midoriya felt when the final bell of the day rang. With all the excitement today, the boy was ready to head home, kick his feet up and just relax for the remainder of the afternoon. His mom wasn't going to be home, he wasn't volunteering at the orphanage and it was rest day from his gym routine, which meant that it promised to be a nice and quiet evening. As he navigated himself through the hallways en route to the exit, Midoriya was so deep in thought that when he turned the corner onto the next hall he couldn't stop himself from colliding with another person. The green-haired teen was able to stay on his feet, but judging from the loud thud that heard, the other person wasn't so fortunate. As soon as Midoriya looked down towards the ground his heart almost stopped beating. Of all the people he had to run into today, this was by far the worst one. The person in question was a blond man with sunken cheeks and hollow eyes. He was bone thin and dressed in an awful looking yellow suit that wasn't anywhere near filled out. All my Midoriya clenched his jaw shut before he could finish, silently hoping that the man didn't hear him. Unfortunately for him, the man got his wits about him just in time to catch his verbal folly. Tashinori Yaga's head shot up, only to be met with the sight of short green hair and emerald eyes looking down at him, and a weird feeling welled up in his chest as he gauged his student's reaction. However, for a brief moment the two locked eyes and Yagi was able to catch something that unsettled him. It passed as quickly as it came, but the emaciated blonde could see the glint of an emotion that he had only seen a few times before. Pure and utter disdain. Yes, sorry, yes, sir, the green-haired boy bowed and apologized before fast walking down the hall and around the corner. An odd sensation formed in what was left of the man's gut, and something in the back of Yaga's mind told him that he should follow the kid and ask him some questions. But he decided against it. Something wasn't right. That boy recognized him in this form. He may have tried to hide it, but the man heard him as clear as day before he shut his mouth and ran off. Instead of heading towards Jim Gamma like he had planned, the blonde man turned around and patted the ground towards the principal's office, all while pulling out his cell phone and dialing one of contacts. Tashinori, what can I do for you? The man at the other end of the line inquired. Namosa, I need your help. With what? Can you do some digging on someone? Depends on who it is. It's one of my students. I'm sorry. Him being serious. I need you to put together a file on whatever you can find. You know, I wouldn't do this if it was anyone else but you asking. But I can tell that it's important. Who is it? His name is Izuku Midoriya. A full day had passed since the Hero Corps students made their return to class. For 1B, things pretty much went back to how they normally were. The classroom was pretty lively and everyone went about their days as usual. They all even managed to get through one of Ectoplasm's infamous pop quizzes yesterday without anyone failing. However, over in class 1A it was a much different story. It was hard for the students not to notice the storm cloud looming over their sister Hero class everywhere they went. Sure, they never interacted with them much before, but even they knew that this wasn't exactly a normal behavior for them. A few of them had tried to strike up conversation with the forlorn students, but it was to no avail. 
As much as the students of 1B wanted to help out their fellow future heroes, there really wasn't anything that could be done. None of them had a clue about what to do or even where to begin. Eventually, they just decided to leave it alone for the time being and let them mourn in peace. Once lunchtime came and went, Ken announced that he needed some students to help out for a training exercise. No one even got the chance to volunteer before he called the names of seven students and ordered them to head over to Ground Gamma and wait there for their instructor. Midoriya, Takage, Honuki, Yanagi, Kodai, Shota, and Fukudashi were the lucky ones to be selected and quickly made the journey down to the training area. In no time, the Hero Course students were suited up and patiently waiting for the teacher to arrive, completely ready for whatever was about to get thrown their way. However, there was one thing that the students couldn't help but take notice of. Well, Midoriya-kun, are these the new upgrades to your costume? Honuki asked while he and the others took in the boys' appearance. For everyone minus Takage, this was not only their first time seeing the boys' helmet but the newest addition to his costume as well. Midoriya decided to go with the black jacket for this particular outing instead of the green. There wasn't any real reason for this, it just happened to be the first one that he grabbed. He figured that he could switch them out whenever he felt like it. Yeah, the boy replied. You didn't have that jacket with you last week. Takage pointed out, only slightly irritated at how this new piece to his wardrobe was hiding his build. Yanagi was the next to put in her two cents. Is it the gift you got from Blizzard? Yeah, she actually gave another one that's green. But this is just the one I threw on. You totally should've worn the green one. But the all black is pretty cool. I'm sure Kiroroken would appreciate it. The lipless teen joked. He's got a point Midoriya-kun. Shota interjected from his position in between Kodai and Fukudashi. You look super intimidating with the full getup. You really think so? Hmm. Kodai nodded in confirmation. The students stood around and talked for a few more minutes before a hulking mass of muscle dressed in red, white and blue appeared in front of them carrying a yellow sleeping bag. I am here All Might stated his signature slogan as he put Aizawa down on the ground beside him. Thank you all for coming here. The black-haired man lazily stated. We need some help with a training exercise that my class is doing this afternoon and I asked Vlad if he could loan a few of his students. I asked him for people with long-range and destructive quirks so I guess you all fit that bill. The 1B students looked at each other as they processed that information. That was actually a pretty good assessment of their group. All of them could easily be considered mid to long range fighters. And out of everyone aside from Shizaki, Kamakiri, Tetsu Tetsu, Kendu, Shishida, and Tsunotori, they could cause some real damage at the drop of a hat. So, what are we going to be doing, Takajest? My students will be going through a team building exercise as a class. To keep things simple, they are going to have to cross the training ground while navigating some obstacles. They are not too difficult, but there's a lot of them out there. So it stands to reason that they'll be pretty winded once they are done. The nocturnal hero explained. That actually sounds like fun. Onuki commented. What I want you all to do is set up an ambush for them near the end of the course. The man continued. All right. Takage nodded. What are the rules? Obviously we can't just go wild, but we're pretty outnumbered here, sensei. There's only seven of us and twenty I mean nineteen of them. You all can do whatever you want as long as it's not too dangerous. Actually, the more chaotic it is, the better. I'll give my students their instructions once they come out of the locker rooms. But for you lot, all you have to do is try and capture one of them. They have to finish as a group or they all fail. Man, that's a pretty wide margin of error. Shota stated. All Might and myself will be watching and officiating in the monitoring area. If you do manage to capture one of them, well call it. I predict that they'll take about 30 minutes to make it to that point as a class. So that should be plenty of time for you to come up with a plan. Simple enough. You can all head over to the other side of training ground and get set up. Once you hear the horn sound, that means my class has started. And remember students, you all can use this as a learning opportunity as well All Might interjected in his usually boisterous tone. There are many times when heroes have to team up with one another on raids and rescue operations. So think of this as one of those situations. Vlad King will be reviewing the footage of your portion of this test and I'm sure that y'all want to impress him. That does make sense. Read Fukudashi's thought bubble. With that, the group of 1B students began making the journey over to their designated stakeout point at the opposite end of the training ground. The mission was pretty simple, but a couple of them had doubts about how effective of an ambush they could mount. They were still outnumbered almost 3 tune and 1A had some heavy hitters that they would need to work around. So that's the plan, Vice Rep Honuki looked to Takage. I'd say we take the easiest route and just grab one of them as soon as they show up. To be honest, all we really need to do is just distract them long enough for Izuku to scoop one of them and fly away. The girl answered. Um, Kodai nodded as she shook her head in agreement. So what, we just go in fast and loud Shota inquired. Midoriya would be lying if he said that he disagreed with that plan. It was the simplest course of action and required the less amount of energy. However, knowing that Bakugou would be there meant that it was going to be far from easy. He wasn't one to underestimate the explosion quirk user before, and he sure as hell wasn't going to start today. Also, this was a good chance for him to get to see all of 1AS quirks since he only got to see a few during the sports festival. Actually Midoriya nervously spoke up, catching everyone's attention. I have a different idea. Oh yeah, Takage quirked an eyebrow at him. Yeah, Aizawa-sensei said that he wanted it to be chaotic, right so why don't we just have some fun with it? 
Did you have something in mind? Said Yanagi. I have a few things, but I want to know what you guys think. Takage immediately threw her arm over the boy's shoulder and gave him a toothy smirk. Well, Spillman, what's going on in that pretty little head of yours? 45 minutes later. Hurry up and stop slacking off you damn extras, Bakugou shouted to the rest of Class 1A as they rounded the corner. God, does he ever stop yelling a tired gyro mumbled under her breath as she did her best to keep up. Just deal with it for now. Yeyurazu told her in a hushed tone. We're almost at the gate. To say that 1A was not having a good time would be putting it mildly. When they were told that they were going to be doing a team-building exercise as a class they were actually pretty excited. With everything that had been going on over the last few days, they could use a more relaxed day of hero training to take their minds off things. However, what they got was over 30 minutes of non-stop obstacles, problem-solving scenarios, and a bit more than their fair share of robots from the entrance exam to fight through. Their mission was simple, finish as a group. On the surface it seemed like a pretty simple objective, but that proved to be easier said than done. The first issue for the class was Bakugou and Todoroki constantly getting away from them and going off on their own. There were more than a few times already that the explosion quirk user just flat out left them with his only instruction for them being to keep up. And Todoroki's less than stellar communication skills caused them to waste valuable time having to thaw out Hagakure and Koda after getting caught up in one of his ice attacks. If everyone was being honest, it was almost like the two of them were having a race. If that wasn't bad enough, Kaminari had gone over his wattage limit fighting some of the robots. Sadu was completely out of sugar cubes after having to do a lot of heavy lifting on an earlier obstacle. Yuraka was on the verge of throwing up from overusing her quirk. And Yeyurazu was already halfway through her fat reserves. Looking back, a few of those tasks could've been handled differently if they thought things through a bit more. But most everyone in the class was off their game. And it might have something to do with the fact that they were short one member of the group. All right, I can see the gate Hagakure cheered, thankful that they were about to be done with this hell. I still don't get why we're being timed for this, Siro complained. We'd get there sooner if you idiots stop slowing me down. Bakugu launched himself forward with another blast. There was no way that he was about to let that half-and-half -half bastard be the first one to cross instead of him. Bakugousen, we have to stay together in a group Yeyurazu said for what felt like the 40th time today. To be frank, the raven-haired girl's patience was starting to wear thin. She liked to think of herself as a level-headed person, but even she had her limits. Somehow, Class 1A was able to stay together in a relatively tight formation as they came upon the last intersection. Only 300 more meters and they were going to be done. And from the looks of it, there were no more obstacles in sight. A sense of relief began to wash over the students only moments before being completely negated. From out of absolutely nowhere, a pile of gigantic metal pipes and what looked like screws suddenly fell from the sky right in the middle of the road a few dozen meters away from them. What the? Kaboom. A massive wall of text literally spelling out the word kaboom appeared in the area behind them while crashing through a few of the nearby structures. What's going on? Ashido shouted. An ambush it only took a second for Yeyurazu to realize the situation that they were in. But by that time, it was already too late. God damn it, Bakugu suddenly shouted. Everyone in the area turned their attention to the ashen teen only to see him floating in midair. Actually, it wasn't just him. Without any warning, Tadaki, Asui, Takoyami, and Rin also began levitating along with Bakugu. Suddenly, the group of five were brought together and collided with one another. Whatever force had taken control of them, it was determined to keep them in place. The students began struggling to break free, but it was to no avail. This is Todoroki gritted his teeth at the familiar feeling. I only know of one person who can do something like this. Yeyurazu thought to herself before looking up towards the sky. There, a few dozen meters above the buildings was a hooded figure dressed in all black. It's Midoriya. What the heck Ajiro suddenly blurted out. Without any warning, the ground beneath the 1A student's feet turned to some sort of mud and they rapidly began sinking into the pavement. Confusion quickly switched to understanding as the students finally registered what was going on around them. It's the guys from 1B said Sadu. Bam. A few meters to the brunette boy's right, the sound of a fist making contact with flesh caught his ear. Him along with Gyro, Ashido and Kurosahima all turned their heads to see Ayama doubling over in pain while clutching his face. Floating above the blonde-haired boy was the upper half of Takage's body. The green-haired girl was sporting a wide grin on her face. All right, pretty boys down the girl cheered. In the air, Bakugo was ready to burst with anger. This was not happening. Shitty Deku and his loser classmates were not about to get the upper hand on him. There was absolutely no way in that he was going to stand by and let this happen. The ash blonde teen had half a mind to try and blast his way through that nerd's telekinesis, but there was one problem. He couldn't move. Bakugo was sandwiched in between Todoroki and Rin to the point where he wouldn't be able to use her his quirk without blowing a hold through them. As good as that idea sounded right now, he knew better than to do that on camera. Birdbrain, use your stupid shadow Bakugo yell was aimed at Takoyami. I can't, the raven-headed teen admitted. What? We're too bunched together for me to call upon Dark Shadow. You're in useless frog face. I don't know where the enemy is. And we're too high up for my tongue to reach the pipes below us, Jiro. The frog-themed girl answered bluntly. 
God damn it. Above them, Midoriya was doing everything in his power not to break his focus. His role in this plan may have been simple, but it was arguably the most difficult. Not only was he tasked with taking out most of 1A's long-range fighters, he had to hold them in place and keep them from using their quirks to break free. Forcing them together with Bakugou in the middle was the best he could think of to avoid the Ash Blonde's wrath. He had no clue if the boy's explosions would be strong enough to break his hold on him, but he wasn't going to risk it. Him surprised that him able to keep Takoy Emerson's quirk under control like this. The only reason in keeping them at this distance is because I don't know the range of his quirk. I guess I lucked out. Down on the ground, Takage had completed part one of her job. Hayama was the next biggest threat seeing as his naval laser could easily cause Midoriya to lose focus on his targets. So her job was to try and knock him out the second she got the chance. With the blonde boy now out of commission, she set her eyes on her next target. Sarah can grab Kayoka and get out of the mud unfortunately, Yayurazu was able to beat the girl to the punch. In the raven-haired class rep's mind, Gyro was their best option for offense right now. 1B may have known about their quirks, but not about their support items. And seeing as Midoriya neglected to remove her from the area as well, he wouldn't be expecting a sonic attack from the girl's boots. The tape quirk user quickly shot a line out of his right elbow and attached it to a nearby pipe before grabbing the purple-haired girl next to him. However, Takage was quick enough to break up her left arm and send four pieces of her flesh flying towards them. The two 1A students could do nothing as they were struck mid-swing. Ciro and Gyro let out a couple of grunts when they hit the ground. But what they weren't prepared for was Shota to activate his twin impact and replicate the previous blows to their abdomens with twice the force. Juzo, we're done Takage shouted. The lipless teen gave a quick nod before resolidifying the ground. Locking the Ayurazu, Ashido, Kirishima, Sadu, Yuraka, Ajiro, Kota, Kaminari, Shoji, Hagakure, Ayama, and Minda in a coffin of waist deep concrete. All right, that's enough. The exercise is over. The voice of Aizawa said over the speaker system Everyone get yourselves in order and return to the monitoring area for your review. And don't keep me waiting. Wow, I'm surprised that we actually pulled that off. Shota gave a slight chuckle as he walked out of a nearby alleyway. Across the street from him, Yanagi and Kodai were also making their approach. Seriously. Honuki added on before he reactivated his quirk and jumped into the mud to retrieve the trap 1A members. A few minutes passed by as the students got situated. Once everyone was safely back on, above the ground, the hero course hopefuls grouped up into one giant mob. The only person not present for this was Midoriya, who for some reason decided to fly back over to the monitoring area ahead of everyone else. What's it about Takage wondered as she watched him retreat behind a couple of nearby buildings. What the heck are you guys doing here Ashido pointed an accusatory finger at the 1B group. All Might Sensei and Aizawa Sensei needed some bodies for this exercise you guys did. And we were the ones picked for the job. The green-haired girl answered on everyone's behalf. That was Midoriya who just flew away, whilst it Todoroki asked. Sure was. Dekubakigu growled in a low tone with an expression of absolute rage on his face. It suddenly became clear to Takage why her friend decided to just go off on his own. More than likely he was avoiding any type of interaction with Bakugu outside of the watchful eye of a faculty member. The girl knew that there was some type of history between the two of them, but didn't know the exact details. All she could say for certain was that it wasn't pleasant and Midoriya obviously wished to avoid the guy if he could help it. Let's hurry up and get back to the teachers. A dejected Yayurazu stated in a neutral tone before making her way to the gate. Back up at the monitoring area, Aizawa watched his class drudge their way onto the platform. Everything had more or less gone according to plan up until the last part of the exercise. The pro hero had to admit that he was impressed with the ambush that his colleagues' students had put together. It may have had a few gaping holes that any pro worth their salt would have been able to exploit. But considering the fact that they were heavily outnumbered and had an ample amount of time to think it up, he couldn't argue with the result. Excellent work students you all did well to navigate through those obstacles. All Might announced to the hero course hopefuls as they gathered around him. Yeah, but we totally got our butts handed to us at the end. Kirishima stated, let's go ahead and start from the beginning Aizawa interjected while scrolling through the footage of each obstacle. A few meters off to the side, the students of 1B were huddled up together in their own little group. They weren't really sure if they were allowed to leave or not, so just to be safe, they stuck around. While the pro heroes were going through a review of the first obstacle, Takage leaned over to Midoriya and whispered to him, so any particular reason why you decided to go off on your own like that? Sorry, to um. The boy fumbled for a brief moment. Hey don't worry, I get it. You're trying to avoid Bakugou, aren't you? Midoriya shot the girl a stunned look before adjusting his gaze over to the blonde-haired student in question. In the back of Class 1A formation, Bakugou was glaring daggers at him. Thankfully he still had his helmet on so the boy wasn't able to see his face. However, the telekinesis user also noticed the cold gaze of Todoroki focused solely on him. Yeah, the boy breathed out in response. If you ever need some help with that guy, let me know. I'm sure I can think of a few good pranks to knock him down a few pegs. The girl smirked. It's fine, Takageson. You don't need to worry about me, I can handle him myself. 
he waved off. It's not like anyone ever bothered to help him out before. So why start now? All right. A little over 15 minutes passed before the video of the ambush finally came into view on the main monitor. Deciding to just go ahead and rip the band-aid off, Aizawa let the footage play out a single time just so everyone could get a good view of happened. It was hard to miss a good portion of the 1A students cringing at how things got out of hand so quickly. So, who wants to go first? The man lazily looked to his class. Well, obviously we got set up. Kaminari was the first to voice his opinion. Seriously, we weren't told something like that would happen beforehand. Siro added on. You're never going to know when y'all get attacked in real life. The teacher stated somewhat harshly. Does anyone have anything constructive? Sui was the one to raise her hand. To be honest, sir, the ambush was executed really well. The 1B students seemed to cover their bases and knew exactly who to go after, Jiro. Him having a difficult time seeing what exactly we could've done. I agree for the most part, but there were some holes in their attack strategy that could've been exploited if you didn't panic. Would anyone care to guess what those were? Aizawa was met with silence from his students as they all pondered about what they could've done. Most of them were drawing a blank seeing as it was over before they really had a chance to do anything. What about you? The man turned their attention towards the 1B students. At some point a few minutes ago Midoriya and Honuki had removed their helmets so everyone could get a good look at their faces. And it was hard for the green-haired boy not to blush at 19 sets of eyes focused on him. Well, from our perspective we pretty much gambled on catching you guys off guard. Talk had started as she propped her elbow up on Midoriya's shoulder. We knew we only had one chance to pull our plan off so we needed to cause as much confusion as possible. If Ayama fired off that laser of his at Izuku here, it might have broken his focus and let your classmates escape from his hold. She pointed to her green-haired companion. If that happened we would've been hosed. Fukudashi's thought bubble spelled out. I was pretty worried about Siro using his quirk to try and capture me before we could get situated. Honuki followed up. The 1A students nodded in agreement. Now that it was said out loud, the aforementioned students were kicking themselves for hesitating for so long and not reacting to neutralize a threat. Okay but still, this almost wasn't even fair. They had all that time to come up with a plan and Midori over there took out all the heavy hitters. Ashido complained while pointing a finger at the green-haired boy. Yeah, how can we fight someone who can move things with his mind and fly his overpowered mind to wind? What the students got in response was the sound of Honuki and Takage letting out a couple of quick laughs after hearing that. Well, Midori Kun is pretty much our class ace. You G guys really give him and me too much credit. The telekinesis user blushed with a wobbly smile. Never one to miss an opportunity to tease him, Takage was quick to playfully pinch his cheek. Aoi you're so adorable. Are they like a thing or something a few of the students blanched? If the walking 3D printer over here used her quirk to put up a smoke screen then shitty Deku wouldn't have been an issue Bakugou made his presence known once again after being silent for the last few minutes. Deciding to ignore the rude comment, Yeirazu considered Bakuga's words and almost slapped herself for not thinking about that. She saw firsthand how putting up a cloud of smoke affected the boy's ability to use his quirk. She got so caught up in the moment that the thought of making some smoke grenades didn't even come to mind. Takage was about to mention how that wouldn't have worked considering she knew that the boy's helmet had an infrared setting, and that once he has you under his control there's almost no way to get out of it. But she held her tongue. It wasn't a good idea to tell people about her classmates' weaknesses. I agree that we could've tried to stay more level-headed, but all of you guys have long-range quirks right once you took out most of our long-range fighters, there wasn't a lot that we could do. Ajiro stated, That's certainly not the case, young Ajiro. All Might interjected, You shouldn't count yourselves out so easily. Yes, they all have quirks suited for this specific type of scenario but that was not the only factor. Quirks errand everything after all. To CH, every set of eyes in the area immediately shifted over to Midoriya. Hearing that comment coming from the mouth of the symbol of peace of all people didn't sit well with him in the slightest. But the boy quickly recovered by pretending to cough into his hand and giving out an apology. Excuse me, not a problem, young Midoriya. All Might's eyes lingered on the green-haired boy for a moment. That was just something else to log into the file that Tsukachi was currently putting together for him. In any case, I want you all to use that part of the exercise as an example of not only how to react in situations like that, but how to execute on the opposite end. Class 1B did their job rather well, even if their entire plan relied primarily on one person. Aizawa told the group, I have one more question, Jiro. Asui raised her hand before directing her gaze towards the 1B students. This seemed like a pretty excessive way to go about things. Why didn't you guys go a more direct route? Shota was the one to explain. Our original plan was just to have Midoriya Kun grab one of you right before you crossed the finish line. And the rest of us would distract you while he got away. Why didn't you do that? Aizawa Sensei said that he wanted something chaotic. Takage smirked. And Midoriya Kun wanted everyone in our group to get the chance to participate. Yanagi stoically added on for the first time in this conversation. The attention was once again turned back to green-haired boy who just gave out a weak chuckle. For the majority of 1A, this was their first time interacting with the guy who pretty much defeated most of their heavy hitters in the sports festival. They had no clue what he was actually like, and the only thing they had to go on were Bakugas less than stellar comments about him. 
Now that they got a chance to see it for themselves, they were quite surprised to see that the boy was rather quiet and non-threatening. Seriously, hmm, Kodai nodded. The last few minutes of the review went by pretty quickly after that. Once everyone had a chance to speak their piece, the students were released to get changed and go back to their respective classrooms. Deku an angry voice shouted at the green-haired teen from the other end of the hall as he stepped out of the locker room. Quickly deciding that avoiding this confrontation was the best course of action, Midoriya chose to pretend as if he hadn't heard a thing. Unfortunately, the universe wasn't kind to him today and he barely made it a few steps down the hallway when a hand placed itself on his left shoulder. The moment this happened, Midoriya felt his anger spike before recomposing himself and turning around. You and me need to have a little talk back, Yugu almost snarled at him. No we don't, Midoriya flatly stated. Why? The explosion quirk user paused. Of all the things Bakugou was expecting to hear, that certainly wasn't it. The nerd's voice was cold and indifferent, but that wasn't the only thing that didn't sit right with him. The way that this useless shit was glaring at him forced a wave of anger to wash over the ashen blonde's body. You little shit. Since when the hell do you have a quirk Bakugou regained his focus and started his long overdue inquiry? That's none of your business. Who the do you think you're talking to like that? Yeah, obviously. Your mother or Bakugou raised his right hand as he primed his quirk and prepared to let off a small blast next to the boy's ear. However, the blonde-haired teen was stopped when his body was suddenly flung back to the nearby wall. Bakugou tried to move his body, but just like during their earlier training exercise, he found himself unable to do so. Look, Bakugou Midoriya dryly started as he approached the now immobilized teen. I'm only going to say this once, even though I already know that you won't actually listen to a word I say. I've done some growing up over the last few months and am not the same person you used to torment every single day. I don't expect you to suddenly start being nice to me after making my life a living hell. But at the very least I'd like for you to just leave me alone. I'm going to kill you, you damn loser. Rage burned behind Bakugus' eyes with each passing second. How dare this worthless shit think that he can do something like this. And you will not be threatening me like that anymore. Midoriya continued as his face contorted into something that Bakugou had never seen before in his life. He couldn't exactly place what kind of expression the greenette was wearing. But it was something between hatred and contempt. Make sure this is the last time something like this happens. Have a wonderful day, Bakugou. That was the last thing Midoriya said before making his way down the hall and out the door. The green-haired teen was smart enough to maintain his hold on the boy until he left the building just in case he was to attack him while his back was turned. Once Midoriya was a safe enough distance away, Bakugou once again regained control of his body. Deku you're gonna pay for that you damn freak the boy snarled as nothing but rage filled every last corner of his mind. Hey Izuku, do you mind if I ask you a question Takage said to the boy as she packed up her bag. The final bell of the day had just rang and most of the students were already out of the classroom. Sure, when's the next time that you're volunteering at that orphanage? Tomorrow. He gave her a confused look. You mind I come with you? Ha huh, okay, if the boy was confused before now he was downright befuddled. I don't have anything to do tomorrow afternoon and I think it would be pretty fun. I'm interested to see what the place is like since you spend so much time there. Plus, I could help out with tutoring the kids since I do have better grades than you and all. Takage smirked and shrugged. In reality she just wanted another excuse to hang out with the boy after class and this seemed like the best time to do it since he was already going to be in the area. Midoriya stood silently for a moment as he thought about it. He was absolutely certain that the lizard tail splitter user had some ulterior motives behind this request that would surely lead to him getting embarrassed in some way, shape or form. But it wasn't really his place to tell her that she couldn't do it. On top of that, he was spread pretty thin the last time that he was there and the staff could really use the extra help. He'll call over tonight and see if it's okay with the staff. But, I think they'll be fine with it. He told her. Awesome, the girl smiled sincerely. Hell yeah, phase one is complete. With that, the two greenettes said their goodbyes and parted ways. Midoriya was in a hurry to get back to his apartment on this particular day. And for good reason. Once Midoriya returned home, the boy gave a quick greeting to his mother and made a beeline straight for his bedroom. As soon as he was inside, he didn't even bother taking off his uniform before planting himself in his computer chair and opening the video chat app on the screen. The telekinesis user patiently waited as the dial tone buzzed for a few seconds before the image of a man with curly black hair and black eyes came into view. Wow five o'clock on the dot. I see you're still as punctual as ever, Asashi Midoriya said with a grin. Yeah well, I know how hard the time difference is on you so I at least want to make sure that I'm on time with our chats. The boy replied in a joking tone. Well I appreciate the consideration. The man replied. So how have you been besides the new haircut? Oh this Midoriya twisted the tips of his hair for a brief moment. I had to cut it so that the helmet for my hero costume would fit. Are sure you didn't do that just to impress some girl come to think of? I do remember you mentioning that one of your classmates was from close to where I work. The black-haired man arched a curious at brow at his son. And I know the greenette slightly blushed. Whatever you say, Izuku. Besides that, how's class going? I remember you saying that you had to cut your internship short in your last email. Is everything alright over there? Yeah, something happened that the school doesn't want us talking about and we had to cut the program short. 
Would this something have anything to do with all those bombings going on over there? I've been reading a few news sites from back home and those have been happening all over the country. Midoriya didn't really have the heart to tell the man that he was almost caught up in the middle of one of those attacks. No, your classmate just got injured and the faculty thought that it was the safest option. That makes sense. Just make sure that you stay safe out there. Yeah, the green-haired boy nodded. So how has work been treating you? Same as always. Just like Midoriya had told Takage on their last outing, Hisashi had a job as a welder in the U.S. What he didn't tell her was that the man worked on satellites and other aircraft. As it turns out, the elder Midoriya male was a specialist in a specific type of welding technique that was in high demand in the aerospace industry. Most of the man's time was spent working on weather and communications satellites that were sent up into the Earth's orbit. Not too long after his parents got divorced when Midoriya was still a child, Hisashi accepted the job offer that forced him to relocate all the way to Texas in the U.S. and had been living there ever since. The money was fantastic and he got to do quite a bit of traveling around the country. Cool. How's your mother doing? Same as always. The boy replied in a neutral tone. Izuku Hisashi furrowed his brow. As much I enjoy being the person you come to when you want to vent stuff out, you really should try and talk to Inko more. You know she's been worried about you ever since what happened last year. The telekinesis user let out a short sigh before responding. I know it's just I don't want her to get worried over every little thing like she always does. You know how she gets. Plus, talking to you just easier and you don't freak out over the smallest stuff. Every time I try to talk about certain things she's liable to flood the apartment. Well, she has a good reason. I know the boy folded his arms with a guilty expression on his face. Can you at least try to talk to her more? I think she'd really appreciate it. Yeah, good. The man smiled. So I'm really interested to hear how your internship with Blizzard went. Did you learn anything cool? The two men continued on with their chat until Hisashi had to call it quits about an hour later. Midoriya was glad that the man took so much time out of his routine to do these video calls as often as they could, despite it being a 15-hour time difference. Once that was over, the green-haired boy slipped on his tracksuit and made his way down to Dagoba Beach for some late afternoon quirk training. Some more junk had washed up onto the shoreline since the last time he was there, and now was as good a time as ever to practice using Hellstorm again since the sun was setting. I really should thank Fubikasen for letting me keep this tracksuit. He smiled to himself as he hopped down the steps, ready to spend some time in his makeshift sanctuary of discarded rubbish.